The NASCAR Beginner for Series powered by iRacing is the premier NASCAR eSports series. Live tonight from the Pocono Raceway, LSR TV and Race Spot TV. Happy to say good evening, Sim Racing fans, and welcome to the 2017 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series presented by Gary Mercer Trucking. Happy to be with you tonight from the Pocono Raceway for the 20th race on this 2017 campaign, or as we get set for the Pocono Mountains 200. We want to welcome you topside into our LSR TV broadcast booth with you. My name is Evan Pasoko alongside with Brian Macklin. For tonight's coverage, two thirds of our regular Monday night crew are not here. Cisco's out of town and he's in fact visiting with the R. James Bike. So, standing in place for him, Hugo Louise uh, for Race Spot TV, pushing the buttons for us. And we're happy that you're joining us tonight on iRacing Live. Brian, coming off of a rather excited race just one week ago from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, first time winner on 2017 for Colson Bermudez. Yeah, I want to start by saying welcome back to Monday Night 7. It's been a while since we've had you here. We've had a lot of exciting racing, as you mentioned. I know you've been keeping up with it, but uh, yeah, last week at Indy was just such an incredible race. And for Colson Bermudez, he spent a lot of time at the front of the field, led 42 of the 80 laps, and went on to win his first race of the season, uh, which was a big moment for him. However, he's got to get into the top 30 in points if he wants that win to count towards a spot in the playoffs. He's currently sitting back in the 34th position in points, so he's got some work cut out for him. Uh, but with still six races left until the playoffs begin, he's got plenty of time to make that happen. And those are going to be some excited races. I do what it out coming up into that playoff. But the championship playoff picture continues to evolve. And with Colson to Bermuda as his win, he adds himself to the current playoff grid. So to the likes of David Washington, David Comstock, Daniel Everhart, Dylan Jones, Trevor Rapolo, Carl Shedd, Andrew Farnaz, and Joseph Tice. Those drivers already had wins as of last week. Bermudez joins that list as the ninth different driver in 19 races this season to get a victory lead, which means the spots in on point are down to just 10th through 16th position. But at the moment, Silver, Vincent, Bowie, Casto, Kelly Ewing, and Cato are the drivers that are in those positions. Nobody's saying, though, that in these next five races after tonight, before that playoff starts, we couldn't see five different winners. So if I'm not Silver or Vincent any further down the line than that, I'm starting to get nervous. Yeah, and if you look at behind the cutoff, there's a pretty good battle for those drivers that are trying to make their way into the playoffs. Nelson Rivera is right on the outside of that cutoff by 15 points. Then you got Lionel Calisto sitting back there at 16 points behind. And then Austin Coop and Anthony DeBarro at 28 and 29 points behind. A slip up by any of these drivers that are in on points right now could lead to one of those drivers being able to work their way inside the top 16 and being able to make their way into the playoffs. So these guys have to be very mindful over the next few weeks not to make any mistakes to not get caught up in somebody else's mistake and ultimately just to try to be as careful as possible to make sure that you get the points you need if you're in a position to go for the win at the end of the race go for it but other than that i think it's points racing for these guys all the way through 
And if somebody like a Sean Bounty or an AJ Brownie were to get a win, that bumps them right up into the category of the drivers with wins. So for Nelson Rivera, you're, you're chasing down Ross Cato into tonight. If somebody behind you wins, that cut line goes another position up the ladder. So you have to be thinking solid finishes. And I agree with your consensus. I would not put the race car in a position where I'm going to wreck it or win it, either or, because I think you got a better shot in that situation to try to go for points. So you really got to get a good month in a row here, though, for those drivers. Or maybe you disagree with us, and maybe you think you got to go for the win, and that's all you got. Well, if you're a driver like a Doug Roth or a Sean Bounty, one of those drivers that's a little bit further back that maybe doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to go up there and steal a, a position away based on points, yeah, absolutely. You need to try to look at these next couple of races and figure out what your best opportunity is to go out there and try to nab a win. Uh, but if you're a guy like Austin Coop who's sitting right on the outside, just 28 points, that's feasible. That's less than a race. If, if one of these drivers were to have a bad race, say Ross Cato comes in here tonight and finishes dead last, and Austin is able to finish up inside the top 10 he could very easily make his way into the playoffs or into a playoff position before this night is over so you've definitely got to play your cards right as we go through these next few races and we've got 200 miles of action for you tonight for the Pocono Mountains to see if somebody else is going to add their name to that now nine name long list of race winners in 2017. With that said, let's go trackside for the 20th time this season and take a look at your LSR TV starting grid for tonight's Pocono Mountains 200. Pole position, get to go to the winner from just one week ago, Colson Bermudez with a 52-1 best to qualifying session. His Aegis Ford Fusion will start from pole joined on the front row by a fast car all week long Brandon Bowie in the number 44 Ford as well David Comstock and Ashton Crowder get to start from row number two that'll be third and fourth respectively Crowder was the fastest driver in practice earlier tonight had a good qualifying effort for one of the names we were just talking about Dylan Jones will roll from fifth Starting in the sixth position here tonight is Andrew Bird. He was seventh fastest in practice, and he, he sped up just a little bit. Then we have Dwayne Vincent. After coming off of his best run of the season last week at Indianapolis, he's looking to back that up. He starts seventh here tonight. Then we have Daniel Eberhardt, who has been fast pretty much everywhere. He starts eighth. Then we have Andrew Freenar starting ninth and rounding out the top ten. Justin Lizenby starts tenth. The Steel Horse live entry, get a roll from 11th position tonight in Sod Row 6 for the 65 of Jonathan Cadell. He'll be joined to the outside by Trevor Ravelo. Kyle Shedd gets the honors of starting in tonight's unlucky to a 13 starting position. He's joined by Shane Ewing and just behind them, Nick Silver. The four parts, 24, will roll from 15th. He comes into tonight as the regular season points leader, David Washington, will start 16th, then Sean Boundy, one of those drivers on the outside of the cutoff spot looking for an opportunity to get into the playoffs. He starts 17th, then we have Giovanni Bramante starting in the 18th position. Sean Castro starts 19th, and Corey Wolf rounds out the top 20. Gabe Wood going to find himself a little bit further back than he would have liked in qualifying. He'll start from 21st spot tonight. Nathan Little in 22nd spot. Brandon Whitaker will start from 23rd position with John Abbott in 24th. And Christopher Hurlow with a lot of work to do behind in 25th. 26th goes to Nelson Rivera. He's uh, hanging on to a position in the playoffs right now. Then we also have... In the number 27th position, Randy Yoakum. And then the last car to take a time in qualifying, Joseph LaPlaca starts 28th. The rest of these drivers all took provisionals. 29th goes to Lionel Calisto. And then 30th, Adam Benefield, who came back last week for his first race since Las Vegas. He finished second to Colson Bermudez. He starts 30th here tonight. He's got quite a bit to go just behind him. 31st position, going to go to Tanner Tarico with the Ross Cato, 32nd. Corbett Amstreet, 33rd. Austin Coop, 34th. Michael Priester, 35th. And Douglas Wyatt in 36th position. All of those names towards the back in based on provisional qualifying times. Looks like two drivers will elect to start from pit road. That'll be the 58 of La Placa and the 22. Uh, Castro. The field rolls to the short shoot between quarters two and three. Quickly talk about this Pocono Raceway. The tricky triangle clock it in at two and a half miles in length with three very unique different quarters. Turn one at 14 degrees. It's based off of the old Trenton Speedway. The tunnel turn in turn two just eight degrees like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Turn three, Brian, just six degrees. It's also the widest quarter like the Milwaukee Mile. Yeah, and that's going to be your big opportunity to make passes. If you can get a good run through turn three down the long front straightaway, the longest straightaway in racing, can set you up for a good pass going off into turn one. 
LSR TV on Race Spot TV. Happy to be with you tonight and happy that you are joining us from the Pocono Raceway. The pace car gonna duck down to the pit lane field in the hands of your pole sitter. Pumidas is off and away. Green flag flies and we are underway for the 20th time in 2017. Keep in mind the restarts at Pocono historically wild. Everybody seems rather tame two by two for the first time. Two by two, everybody except for Colson Bermudez and Brandon Bowie just got shot out of a cannon coming off of turn one. He was side by side with David Comstock. He was able to clear Comstock and now tries to chase down Colson Bermudez. Meanwhile, behind them, they're still side by side as they head to the tunnel turn for the first time here today. Dylan Jones is going to inch ahead of Ashton Crowder and Daniel Everhart, but they're still battling side by side. This is a very tricky corner, Evan. It's very hard to navigate turn two when you are too wide. As you mentioned, it's much like Indianapolis, and there's just not a lot of room there for two wide racing. So far, though, as we get ready to complete lap one, everybody made it through nice and clean. You see Eberhardt goes for a slide job in turn three. It's not going to happen, though, as Ashton Crowder powers back on the inside. Crossed him up, and he'll get the position at the start finish line, but at the completion of lap number one, it is Colson Bermudez out in front to the two to two tenths of a second. Brandon Bowie, though, is not all that far back. Looks like the top ten. They've got themselves single filed out after an opening lap. we got to look a little bit deeper back. The 31 machine struggling off for the restart. That's just a person beat. Got real high down in quarter number one. He'll be able to get his spot back, and the 45 Carl Shedd wasn't able to get the position on him. But that 24 Nick Silver is charging up through the field and as he kind of works his way on the inside David Washington likes that call he'll bring his car to the inside and we got some side by side middle of the pack and yeah, lots of side by side racing going on in the middle of the pack as you're going to see that Nick Silver is going to inch ahead of David Washington now and tries to work or I'm, I'm sorry I have that backwards there uh, he's trying to work his way through here now as Justin Elizabeth you just talked about him as well one car gets loose right up in front of these guys that was Andrew Freenars in the 47 got sideways coming up off of turn three and almost lost it, but did a great job hanging on to that car. And that's one of the, the tricky points of this racetrack. They call it the tricky triangle for a reason. Uh, coming off that corner as flat as it is, and you're trying to pick up the gas the way these drivers are so you can carry as much speed down that long front straightaway, it can be very tough to get off that corner cleanly uh, without upsetting the car like we saw Freenars do there uh, coming off turn three. Uh, that's going to be something these drivers are going to fight throughout most of the night, especially once the tires really begin to wear out and, and they start losing time. Uh, traction that's going to be where it gets really difficult for these guys and I don't think it was him on the opening lap but there was somebody with a very similar colored race car that had the same issue coming out of turn three on lap number one so definitely going to have to be keeping an eye on the exit at turn four as the night goes on the field just gets so spread out here so quickly at Pocono Sean Caston with a 22 machine has been having his issues. We noted that he started from the pit lane, so he's trying to work his way back up through the field. That puts him at about a 32-second disadvantage. Good news is it's a big racetrack, so he's got quite some time before he has to worry about maybe race leaders coming up and lapping him. Side by side inside of the top 10. It's a battle for eighth position. The 40 Don of Andrew Bird under attack by Farnars on the inside of the racetrack. The 88 machine holds him tight. They'll head off to that tunnel turn and quarter number two. The 40 Don looks like he really didn't want to fight it that much he will give up that position and move the 88 now back up plus one and that was a really impressive move by Andrew Freenars to take that position away. And now he's going to move one step closer up to the eighth position. But now you begin to see as we complete four laps here, this field is really beginning to get strung out. And that's a, a big thing that happens here at Pocono. The longer the runs get, the more strung out the field typically gets. And you can see there's already almost a full 10 seconds from the leader back to 33rd place. So in just a handful of laps, these guys have gotten really spread out. And, and you look at the front, though, Colson Bermudez has not gotten too far ahead of Brandon Bowie as that is only about a three car length advantage over him and then you got David Comstock and Dylan Jones right behind him the leaders are staying pretty close but everybody else has gotten pretty strung out just trying to hit their marks and run a, a clean race here just to, to get through the beginning stages of this thing David Washington at a 98 continues to try to make up for the relatively poor qualifying effort for your regular season points leader. He's trying to get around the 31 machine at the moment. Listen to be in front of him, not giving it up, but it's a couple of cars in this fight. The 45 and uh, as well behind them looks like maybe Shane Ewing in the battle. All four of them get a single file out off of turn three 
The 98 getting continued to dig is plus three already in this race. It wants to get a little bit more. But to what you were talking about, about the top guys running, in fact, the top six cars in a single file line, they've all got about three car lengths in between each of them, but they're only 1.2 seconds apart, top to bottom. In fact, Bowie has closed in the gap. Bermudez was further away from him than he is now at a quarter number one on the opening lap of the race. So the 44 keeping the pressure on, and, a four, and the 42 of Comstock, I think, maybe being a part of that because he and Jones have been battling. They're right up at a doorstep of the 44 now. So if Bowie doesn't challenge for the race lead, he'll be playing defense. And Brandon Bowie is one of those drivers that has been so fast pretty much everywhere they have went this year, but just has not been able to capitalize and get one of those wins yet. And he would love to get a win here at Pocono. Uh, he's showing a tremendous amount of speed right now. As you see, he's going to continue to close that gap down. Is this down to less than a car length here as they approach turn one? Uh, I do believe that this is a track that really favors a driver like Brandon Bowie because this is the, the track... Uh, that requires a lot of rhythm. You have to be able to get through these corners cleanly, and you have to be able to hit your marks lap after lap after lap, more so here than any other track. It's not like your typical cookie cutters. If you get out of rhythm here, you're going to lose a tremendous amount of speed because if you don't get off the corner well, you're not going to carry as much speed down these long straightaways, which is going to hurt your lap time easily by a tenth, maybe two tenths, depending on how bad your corner exit was. Uh, so you really have to focus on that throughout the race. And you see here, Bowie is really closing the gap down as he's all, all over the back bumper of Coles and Bermudez now as they work through turn three, trying to carry that speed off the corner, but not quite going to be able to get the gas down, and it looks like Bermudez is going to pull away. And they're going to head down now the 3,700-foot front straightaway, the longest stretch at a racetrack, the back straightaway between turns one and two, 3,055 feet, and you're almost at 2,000 feet in what we call the short shoot between two and three, not that short. So it is a very long racetrack, two and a half miles in length, as noted. We obviously always refer, typically, to Daytona and Talladega as the longest tracks. A real race in Full Throttle Cup Series calendar. The super speedways are the only plate tracks on the calendar, but Pocono is right up there, and drafting has been a pretty big thing that we've been seeing guys work with. You almost see guys right up on each other as they head to the quarter. So a still a stalemate up front. you got the top six nice and tight together. Nobody's really lost any time. In fact, to Everhart in P6, has made up two tenths. So the top six are all within one second of your race leader, Colson Bermudez, who still uncontested to this point, has led now all eight laps in this race, but he's not getting any further away from Bowie and company. Yeah, and him being out front and being able to grab the pole the way he did is really no surprise to me because a lot of people say that Pocono and Indianapolis race very similarly, and if you carry a good amount of speed at Indy, you're typically going to bring it here to Pocono as well. And and I think we're seeing that out of that 14 machine. He was so fast last week at Indy and dominated a big portion of that race, and he's brought that speed here as well. And he's not really pulling away from these guys. I wouldn't say he's dominating so far, uh, but he's holding a pretty good lead. Oh, Bowie almost gets into the wall off turn two. That allows Comstock to look to his end inside. Comstock's going to make that pass. Looks like he was going to get clear of him, but Bowie's going to fight back on the outside line now, carrying some speed. They got that little bit of a grip strip up there, and he's going to fight back. I think he's actually going to be able to win this battle as they now work down turn or down the front stretch, and indeed he will as Comstock now is stuck on the inside. Here comes Ashton Crowder looking to his outside. And you can see how important the momentum is. The 44 lost some by getting up against the wall, and he got jumped on by the 42 into 27. But then because Comstock gave up the preferred lane to try to go to the inside, he didn't get the arc into turn three. You just can't get off the quarter like that, and that's put him in a compromising position because Crowder's been trying to get to his outside. However, 27, not the best exit out of one. This time, now the back, the 42 jumps back up in line. Single file for second, third, and fourth. Then you head back off to the tunnel turn. In the past seasons, the RSR Full Throttle Cup Series, we've seen many different kinds of races here at the Pocono Raceway. One year ago, just one caution flag in this event. Two years ago, nine caution flags, accounting for 53% of the race laps being run under the yellow flag. So far, so good. At eighth of the way there with 10 laps complete for the 14. Yeah, they have had a really good start to this race, which is something that you want to see. And as we say that, it looks like there's a car around in the back coming off of turn three. So I think you might have just jinxed these guys and afforded them their first caution of the evening. And that goes to the number eight machine of Randy Yoakum. I saw that in the background. He got loose off turn three. We talked about that earlier. He was able to correct it, keep it from hitting the inside wall too terribly hard. He just backed it in and got a little bit of rear end damage. But unfortunately, Evan Pasoko, that's going to bring out our first caution of the evening and that should result to all the leaders coming down the pit road. 
And I'll type C in the sim and claim responsibility for that one. But yeah, that was exactly like the two close calls that we saw in the opening two laps. And obviously, if guys are struggling early on, yeah, nine laps of those tires. Not going to get any better. And unfortunately for him, he wasn't able to catch it. I think when he snapped it back up the hill, that's when the yellow came out. And then unfortunately, he didn't lock up the brakes until it was too late. And then that car rolled backwards into the inside fence. So could have been a lot worse. That car could have nosed it into the inside fence. And then when he caught it the first time, might have been able to escape without damage. Nonetheless, caution will come out at the completion of lap number 10. And drivers are going to catch up to the pace car for what we can presume to be drivers headed down pit side this time under the yellow. They pick up the pace car, looks like coming out of corner number one. So they've got a little bit of time to decide what strategy call they want to make. Well, and I was actually just sitting here and, and thinking about that and kind of looking at some of the lap times that the leaders were running before the green or the caution came out. I think this might be an opportunity for some of the drivers that are mid-pack to maybe go for a two-tire strategy. The tires really didn't fall off that badly. It was about a half a second uh, from their fastest point to what they were running right there at the end of the run. So I, I do think that... Uh, there is some fall off that could cause a problem, but if you're one of these drivers that's mid-pack, what do you really have to lose at this point? Take an opportunity. It's early enough in the race where if it doesn't work out for you, you can come back in at a later time, get four tires, and be back on equal tires with everybody else. I, I, I like the call of making two if you're one of these drivers, say from 10th to 15th on back. With the exception of the 64 of Michael Priester, who started this race uh, way back in what was going to be the 35th position, and who is uh, seven laps down to this point. He was coming to collect a green flag and then dropped from the sim at that moment, had to reconnect, he lost seven laps. Everybody else is on the lead lap, so that's good news for the drivers. The two names that we noted at the start of this race that started from pit road, they did not want to double up for the green flag. I would assume that they'll come down pit road this time, get four tires, continue to hang out at the back of the pack. The night is still young with well over 68 laps to go, but all your race leaders down pit road this time. Doesn't really look like anybody wants to stay to the left side of the pit wall. Let's see what the call is on tires. Everybody following the 14. And as Colson Bermudez and company start to get into their pit boxes, it looks like David Comstock slid through and is going to have to back up. That's going to be a very costly mistake for the number 42 machine. And as we watch that, you see everybody else on pit road getting, it looks like four tires and fuel. I don't think anybody's going to go for two. It looks like everybody's going to get four, and Colson Bermudez will easily win the race off of pit road. Then you have Brandon Bowie, Daniel Eberhardt, and Ashton Crowder. And it looks like Comstock must have lost six, seven, maybe eight positions coming out. He's uh, buried back in the pack after that mistake. He came into pit road in third, but he got beat off of pit road by Lizardby, Washington, Bird, LaPlaca, Silver, Vincent, Crowder, Eberhardt, Bowie, and Bermudez. It was a very costly overshoot of the pit box with the driver of the 42 and Bermudez got very lucky he went all the way to the end of the pit box and you can see it he was basically on the white line to the front high racing said good enough and he's going to be able to maintain the race lead the number one pit stall obviously helps out in those kind of scenarios here at Pocado the line is right at the end of pit road However, uh, not really battering there because he was so clean in and out that he had a good two, three car lengths off of the pit lane. So he'll get back out onto the racetrack second in line. Austin Coop did not come down pit road the last time by. I would presume that he's headed to pit side this time around behind the wheels of the number six Toyota Camry. Uh, we'll wait and find out if that is going to be the call. Would be a little bit gutsy to stay out this early. Yeah, I think he uh, looks like he's actually going to go ahead and stay out. He's not making any signs like he's coming to pit road. My initial thought was maybe he's going to stay up here, try to lead a lap and get a bonus point to go towards trying to make the playoffs because that would be a, a pretty big point for him. It could come down to that at the end of this thing when we get to the, the beginning of the playoffs. So uh, not sure what the, the call here is, if he's going to come back down next time by. I don't believe he's going to be able to because I have to believe these guys have two to green. And with the I racing sim, if you don't come to pit road when pit road opens, and it, once it does close at two to green, you can get served with a one lap penalty or a stop and go penalty under green, my, my apologies, uh, if you do pit uh, after pit road has become closed. So I don't think he's going to be able to come back down this time, Evan. I think he's going to have to stay out here and, and see how this car is going to handle on the restart. Well, the problem for him was he was so far back that he, again, he started this race in 34th position. 
And the problem was typically somebody will stay out, they'll refrain from pitting, and they'll lead that lap because drivers coming in from turn four have to drop down to pit speed, which is substantially slower than pace speed here. It's a different of 15 miles an hour, but he was only 16th position, but he crossed the start finish line because he was that far back in line. The leaders had already crossed the start finish line on the pit lane. So he led the last time by. So if the objective was to come or to stay out rather, get a bonus point, then he would have to pit this time around. But to the point that you noted, pit road should be closed if we are coming to one to go. That's why oftentimes we see drivers drive straight through the pit lane and then they are allowed to pit at the one to go because they've already been on pit road during that. The uh, Not the case for the six. So we'll see. He could just come down pit road and take the penalty. If it's an EOL penalty, then if he's going to be at the back anyways, it's not going to be too big of a factor. We'll have to see what the six can do. If he does stay out, It'd be quite the call to go from 34th, no laps in practice, no laps in qualifying, to leading this race after just 14 laps. We'll find out what the call is, though, for the number six this time at a quarter three. Walks it down a little bit, but I don't think he's going to pit road. He will stay out, and this is going to be a whale of a restart. Well, I think this was a good call because he, there was only 11 laps on the tires when that first caution did come out, or 10 laps even on the tires when that first lap, or first caution did come out. So the tires hadn't fallen off that badly to the point where he's going to be in trouble. Do I think he's going to hold on to the lead and hold these guys off? No, probably not. Uh, but considering, like you mentioned, he started back in 34th. I don't think he's going to fall back to 34th, Evan Pasoko. I think he might fall back outside of the top 10, maybe outside of the top 15. But I think at some point he will settle in in a position and be okay. It's just not going to be where he's at right now. Uh, he could have come to pit road right there, like you mentioned, but he would have been given a penalty. And I, the, the penalty for pitting once pit road is closed is the stop and go under green. Uh, that very well could have led to him falling a lap down, depending on how this thing would have worked out. Uh, so that's a very risky call on his part to have to make that. I think this was the right call for the six car he was running in 30th position when the caution flag came out so as long as he doesn't fall to 31st position it's a win on the strategy now you mentioned half a second or so of a fall off everybody who we saw pit up front went with four tires so you're gonna have about a half a second you would assume difference per lap I don't see the 14 or maybe the 44. Bowie might be at a better spot because we'd be to the inside of Route 2 struggling to get around him. But we'll see how the 6 navigates himself through traffic. That could be the hold your breath moments. Coming out at quarter number 3. Ace car going to dive uh, back down to the pit lane as we come through the turn this time upcoming. So Bermudez has led every lap of this race until he came down to the pit lane. And being on the outside of row 1 tends to not be as good of a restart position than the inside of row two and third. However, Bowie will be stuck behind the six if Coop is a little bit slow going with the old tires. We'll see maybe just how far they fan out and how many lanes of racetrack they make down to quarter number one. 15 laps gonna be complete from Pocono. Green flag flies as we go back underway. And 44, not the best jump, will go side by side for the race lead with Bermudez on the outside. Does he keep the car up there or does he tuck in line to turn one? I think with the fresher tires, this is going to work to Bermudez's advantage. And as they work through turn one for the first time on the restart, indeed it does as Colson Bermudez easily goes around Austin Coop to take the lead. Now, Brandon Bowie is charging on the outside line. He's also going to be able to get clear of Coop as they head to turn two. Coop is now stuck trying to hold off Ashton Crowder and Daniel Everhart. As they work into turn two, Everhart now goes to the outside line. A very risky move on the part of him, but it's going to pay off. And I think that's going to be the call for Ashton Crowder as well as now Coop gets put three wide. As they head to turn three, you've got Nick Silver on the bottom, Austin Coop in the middle, and Dwayne Vincent in that third groove. And immediately we are seeing Austin Coop drop back. He's going to lose seven, maybe eight positions before they get back to the stripe. And now here comes David Comstock looking to the inside as well. And that's what I was warning about on the restart. I don't think the six is concerned with losing 15 or 20 spots on the run, but it's how he falls back. And it was a really close call. And the, I think, coming out of the tunnel turn with the 24 is silver. And he's at a better spot now. The six can go up to that third most lane. And it'll give the faster traffic the preferred lane on the inside. But he is still slow at a quarter number one, as expected, on older tires. Over hats off to everybody so far so good on working their way through. The top 10 have single filed out pretty quickly on this run and Bermudez was able to maintain the top spot but we are still two by two from 10th on back. Comstock in a battle between he and Anna Benefield for that 10 spot. 
And how about Adam Benefield making the return last week here at or last week at Indianapolis? And he made the statement in his post-race interview. He's back. He's got to get back into the top 30 in points, and then his win from Las Vegas is going to count towards the playoffs and would give him a playoff position. So that is one thing we didn't note in the pre-race show, Evan Pasoko, is if Adam Benefield climbs back in there, those guys that are holding on to the position in the playoffs, like Ross Cato, who holds the last position in points, if Adam Benefield gets top 30, he's outside of that by two points behind Shane Ewing. So uh, those guys have to be mindful of that as well because B Benefield uh, is definitely fast enough and with six races to go can certainly get the job done. And running up inside the top ten like he is right now, that's something these guys need to be paying attention to. It would be quite the story for him to come back and just be able to sneak in. He still has to get the job done and put that car into victory lane but looks fast at the moment inside of the top 10 he started way back in 30th another one of our drivers who started towards the tail end of the pack without a qualifying time earlier on in the evening you got a three-way battle for the race lead though the 44 of Bowie and the 90 of everhart everhart wanting to make it a fight for a second he'll look to the inside he can't get it done that time last run it was a six-way fight for the race lead this time it is a nine-way or rather three-way fight for the guys up front but they are a lot tighter together all three drivers within three tenths of a second of each other and everhart this time the challenger to the 44. And now Everhart, has he got a great run coming up off of turn two. I thought he was going to look to the inside of Brandon Bowie, but I think he wanted that outside line. He's running up in that third groove through turn three, trying to carry that momentum up off the corner. He's going to be able to get the grip down. No, he's not. He got sideways coming off the corner and loses a ton of time to Brandon Bowie down the long straightaway. And you can see right there just how much that momentum can hurt you. When you lose that speed coming off the corner the way we saw Everhart do, he got gapped by about two car lengths going down the straightaway. He's able to make it up back now down here in turn one as he drove it off into turn one to close that gap back down. Uh, but that's just how important it is to make sure you get off the corner well and carry speed down these long straightaways. That's how much time you can lose if you don't carry that speed properly. Fight is on inside of the top five. It'll have to wait. Caution flag flies and its issues on the back straightaway. The 10 of John Abbott, one of the drivers involved as he goes spinning. But I think it all started up in front of him. Yeah, that started with Carl Shedd in the number 45 machine coming up off the corner. Looks like he got help from behind. I can't tell who that was behind him. That's the number seven machine of Nelson Rivera that kicks him sideways going down the straightaway, and that leads to several other cars getting caught up in that. It uh, looks like at least a five or six car wreck down the back straightaway, and for Carl Shedd, I don't believe he's going to be able to continue on. That was a pretty hard hit to the outside wall uh, that really hurt him. One person this does help, though, Evan Pasoko, is the driver that just stayed out just a couple of laps ago, Austin Coop. He had fallen back to 17th, but as a result of this caution, he should be able to get back on the same cycle as all the leaders, and he'll have definitely made a net gain considering he was 31st when that caution came out. We'll see if he decides to stay out with everybody else. Of course, as, as more laps go on, the tire disadvantage is going to become less and less obvious because you know, the guys off of the pit lane, those tires really have a bite for the first couple laps. They're still going to be better than the sixes for however long they decide to stay out, but it's going to become slowly less and less as time continues on. He did end up in 17th position, but the car is in one piece, so I would consider that successful to this point. Yeah, he was actually right ahead of that wreck when when it began. He was in front of Carl Shedd by about five car lengths when that happened. So certainly got to be counting his blessings that he did not get caught up in that and was able to stay ahead of that mess before it happened. But I imagine we might see these drivers come back down pit road once again here. Pit road should be open this time by, and we'll have to wait and see what these drivers elect to do. Carlos Bermuda is still the race leader. He took it back from Austin Coop on that last restart, and he hasn't really looked back other than that. Uh, he's leading these guys around turn three now waiting to see what the decision is going to be looks like everybody is peeking towards pit road is anybody going to take a chance and stay out looks like so far everybody's coming i don't see anybody deciding they're going to uh, stay out on the racetrack so everybody coming down for their second round of pit stops and now we wait and see what these drivers are going to do two tires four tires fuel only that's going to be a big question as these drivers head to pit road 
And I'm surprised that everybody's going to be back down this run a lot less of a distance than that first one was, though, in which everybody took four tires. Is this the time at which we see maybe a two-tire call? Race leaders in, trailed by the 14 machine to Colson Bermudez, who goes to the number one pit stall once again. Looks like tires are a premium here tonight. Your race leaders are going to go for four off the pit lane, side by side. Bermudez going to come off behind the number 37 machine. So strategy call by the 37 ages Ford. Take it a look. It looks like he missed the pit box, but you're trying to go in a little bit too late. He was too busy following the 32 down pit road, missed the pit stall. So that is uh, good news for Bermudez. It means he'd be the first driver off of the pit lane. Um, he's not the only driver though who didn't pit and he came down to the pit lane. I guess the good news, if anything, for him is that he'd be able to pit at the one to go because he drove through. Uh, Gabriel Wood did not come down pit road. At the moment of caution, he was running in 34th position. He just came over the radio and said that he will be coming back down pit road. Was 23rd at the strike the last time, so he's not going to get a bonus point if he pits this time. Yeah, he's in a similar situation that we saw Austin Coop in that last time uh, for, for the first caution. And I do want to take note that Austin Coop did come to pit road with these drivers. So he's, for the first time since the immediate green flag or the beginning green flag, he is on the same tires as all the guys around him. So he shouldn't have as chaotic of a restart as he had last time by. Uh, he did a pretty good job, though, hanging on to that thing and not falling further back than he did. Uh, so pretty impressive on his part. Now we're waiting to see if Gabe Wood will come to pit road and, and if Giovanni Bramante will come back to pit road. And so far, it looks like neither one of them are going to come to pit road. Never mind. Here comes Giovanni Bramante. He's going to go ahead and duck back down. But Gabe Wood's going to take a chance as well and stay out there on the racetrack and maybe try to lead these guys to the next green flag. So I was expecting that the 37 would come down to the pit road of Bramante because he missed the pit box. But Gabe Wood came over the radio and said that he's not going to Austin Cooper. So he gets the bonus point for leading the lap. Now he will come down to the pit lane and assuming that this would be coming to the one to go. And again, the drivers would already be aware. We know when it's one to go when you know, and that's when the lights on top of the iRacing.com official pace car go out. But if it is to be one to go the next time by, the drivers have already been told by the sim that they're at two to go. I believe that would put the 09 at the penalty that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, it certainly would. And, and like I said, that's a stop and go penalty under green flag. And and the issue with coming down pit road when you have a field that's this big is he's going to be restarting back around the 32nd position, give or take a few, depending on if the lap cars are able to get in front of him. Uh, that's going to be very tricky for him because he's going to have to make a full lap, which means he's going to lose 10 to 15 seconds, possibly uh, just in one lap trying to get up to speed. And then he's going to have to make about a 45 second run down pit road because this is such a long pit road and you're only going 50 miles an hour uh, you're going to spend a lot of time on pit road you could potentially be in a position where you might come out and lose a lap now fortunately for him right now there's nobody else that would be one lap down so he'd be able to catch a break and get the lucky dog should we get another caution uh, but that's still a situation i'm just not sure i'd want to put myself in uh, especially this early in the race Talking about drivers laps down, four drivers are off of the lead lap right now. All of them are out of this race. 33rd, Carl Shedd, 34th, Randy Oakham, 35th, Douglas Wyatt, and 36th, Michael Priester are all retired from this race. And Wood does drop to the pit lane this time by. He gets his bonus point, and he is on pit road interesting call on his behalf after starting in 21st position kind of the opposite of what happened when we saw Austin Coop do this under the last last day alone to which he ends up gaining positions uh, Gabriel Wood is actually going to lose positions based on his staying out under the yellow so nonetheless he is getting his four tires he will join back up towards the rear of the field and the lights are out on top of the pace car when we go back green we'll have 24 laps completed baby on the night working under our second caution flank of the evening to this point yeah, and I think Colson Bermudez is very happy that he does not have to restart in the second position yet again. Although he did a good job on the last restart, he was able to time the restart pretty good, stay even with Austin Coop down into turn one, and then was able to easily make his way by him. But this time he gets to control the restart. He doesn't have to worry about that. He can go when he feels comfortable, and he can try to get ahead of Brandon Bowie and Ashton Crowder and the lot behind him, uh, which is going to be a pretty big moment for him because we have seen that Brandon Bowie has the speed to keep pace with Colson, uh, and I think over 
over the longer run, you see that Brandon Bowie typically seems to be running him down. Uh, these short runs might actually be keeping Bermudez out in front because Bowie looks like he's got a pretty good car. Uh, once they get five, six, seven laps on the tires and he can really uh, start using those tires to his advantage, I think that's something to look out for if we start getting a long green flag run. And I think that's the amount of time it takes him just to catch back up to the 14. Not that Bermudez is rocketing away, but he's had some solid starts. And on that first restart specifically, when they were side by side, it was a little bit different on the last one with Koopa Mix because they were third and second and on different rows. But Bowie was about four tenths back, closed that gap into two tenths before the yellow came out. So they're going to be side by side once more. We'll see what they can do. Ashton Crowder up to a race high fourth position. And Daniel Everhart up to a race high P4 on the outside is where they run it at the moment. A base car down and away. Green flag flies as we go back underway. Good jump for the inside of the How about some three wide? Nick Silver to the outside. That way, three way for four. Three wide as they head to turn one for the first time, and Nick Silver is going to be out on the outside line. Can he find some grip up there and make it work? It doesn't look like he's going to. He's going to fall back in line behind Dwayne Vincent and Daniel Eberhardt, but now the battle is on for second place as Ashton Crowder looked to the inside of Brandon Bowie but couldn't get the run up off turn one. He's going to have to fall back in line, but how about Bowie? He got a really good run up off turn one, closes right on the back bumper of Colson as they head through the tunnel turn, and he stays right on the back bumper of Colson, and now Nick Silver goes around on the back stretch. He's down in the grass, and the caution is out uh, once again, but it looks like he caught a lucky break, Evan, as he did not hit anything, just got kicked sideways, uh, but unfortunately loses all that track position. He was in the fifth position when that happened. And you're taking a second look on the replay. I think a little bit of a combination of two factors. I think he was sideways in the 24, and I was going to say that the 49 behind a bird might have pushed up, but I don't think so because Bird was doing a good job of giving the 42 a Comstock room on the outside, and I think that was just Nick Silver getting a little bit sideways. And uh, that's all it took to track that car a little bit to the left. A round two went off of the nose of the 49, a very minor incident as that car was able to get woed up before it even got down to the inside fence, but it does slow things down once more. Yeah, he got very lucky that there was some asphalt there where he could lock the brakes down and be able to slow that car down. That was pretty much what kept him from going and slamming into the inside wall and potentially ruining his night. Uh, so he's just going to have to come in, get four fresh tires, maybe a change of underwear as well, and then get back out there. The problem is he's currently being scored in the 31st position. So all that track position that he had worked so hard to get, he's going to have to do it all over again. He had started back in the 15th position and found his way up into the top five. And now, unfortunately, he's all the way at the back of the pack. So unfortunate moment there for the number 24 machine. Uh, but like you mentioned, this does get us back under caution here yet again. And for Colson Bermudez, I don't think he's necessarily looking for a bunch of cautions like this. I think he wants to try to get into a rhythm and see if he can't get away from these guys. At least try it out again. Bowie might be a little bit better on the long run, but I can only say might be because we haven't had a large enough sample size to figure that out. So the 14th machine would obviously like to get going. In fact, a comment from the driver over the radio. Uh, not a fan of the restart box. He says this restart box is awful, and at most tracks, pace car will drop down and away, and there's a considerable amount of time, handful of seconds between when that pace car drops down and when the green flag actually comes out. The green flag is displayed in the session when the drivers reach the end of the restart box. And that gives the race leader a little bit of time to prep and decide what he wants to do on the restart here. As soon as that pace car is out from in front of the control car, the green flag is coming out. That's like a half of a second tops, and it really rushes things off of the corner. They're essentially still unwinding the wheel, coming down the front straightaway, but the time that pace car drops down, it ends. So Bermudez not having fun on the restarts, I think that's just an added point that would uh, agree with the sentiment that you were talking about, that he would really like to get a green flag stretch going so he doesn't have to keep going through that routine. Well, and it is a very difficult restart box. This is the hardest one to be uh, the leader, uh, as a matter of fact, I would say, for uh, any of our NASCAR tracks. Because, like you mentioned, and not even sometimes it's not even when the pace car drops off. Sometimes the pace car is still actually on the racing surface, and the green flag has already been displayed. So it's very difficult to be the leader uh, on a restart here at Pocono. And it's extremely easy, if you're the guy starting second on the outside line, to be able to try to jump the leader and stay even with him as you go to turn one. And truthfully, if you can stay even with the leader and stay on his door down into turn one, that's an advantage for the guy on the outside because you can pinch
pinch the leader down, force them to have to check up or run into you, and then if you can get them to check up, you're going to be able to get the run up off turn one and take the lead uh, heading down towards the tunnel turn. So it's a very frustrating thing if you're in Colson's uh, position, uh, just because you know that that driver that's starting to your outside has a pretty good opportunity to try to trick you and jump ahead of you on the restart. Couple of the drivers trickled down to the pit lane. You saw it towards the back of the pack as the field went into corner one and everybody up front bypassed the pit lane under the caution flag. Couple of the drivers towards the back come in. Uh, not a bad call, no reason. If you're outside of the top 20 or so to come down to the pit lane, get some fresh tires, top her off on fuel, you might lose two or three spots here or there. But if a race were to break out in uh, some sort of a green flag run, then you might find yourself in an upper hand. And it's those kind of calls that can get lost in all the noise. Obviously, we're watching what the drivers up front are doing. If somebody up front, uh, you know, comes down, does two tires or four tires, it's noteworthy. Or if somebody stays out, like we saw Coop do earlier in this race, and it's noteworthy. But almost every single caution, you're going to have guys towards the back of the pack coming in and topping off. And they might not seem like a factor now. Just note that we told you about them. If something happens late in this race and we end up at a crunchy numbers game, they'll end up with about six laps more fuel. Well, and that could be a factor because the fuel window at this track is about 31 to 35 laps. Uh, so that, that's definitely something to keep note considering they are at, uh, what's this, about 53 laps to go. Uh, actually, I guess it's really not because I had some Jacob Silver math going on. Uh, that would be still a one-stop race from here to the end for pretty much everybody. Uh, so not really a big factor unless we get a caution again in like, say, 12 laps and then they elect to to not pit or to or whatever. Uh, it could still be a little bit of a factor, but not really sure it's gonna be a, a big deal here. Uh, I think it's just more so the fact they wanted to come in, get fuel, and, and maybe just try to get away from some of the trouble because we've seen some wrecks towards the middle to the front of the pack. Uh, I think maybe some of these drivers are just feeling like they're safer at the back right now. And Pocado has a whole list of ways that you could find yourself in issues with. We uh, talked to, at the top of the show about how restarts can be pretty crazy, and to be fair, we haven't seen the four and five wide yet. However, with each past caution period and with each next do up restart, there's less time left in the race. I think that uh, everybody's gonna get a little bit more antsy on those restarts. So not only do you have to deal with traffic at a place like this, but we've also been talking about just trying to reel in the handling of your own car as a problem. So that's basically keeping your hands full, watching the guys around you, keeping an eye on your car, trying to make sure it stays in one piece. It's a lot of different ways people can find problems. We've seen them up front inside of the top five. We've seen them towards the back outside of the top 20. So either or, just make sure that uh, you try to find yourself in some clean space. And the surefire way to do that as the lights go out on top of the base car is to be the driver in first position. Ramita is going to look to get another good job. Yeah, absolutely. And as he tries to do that here on this next restart, he's going to be mindful. We've already heard he does not like the restart box, so he's going to be mindful of what Brandon Bowie tries to do on the restart. The last time we went green, Bowie was able to stay even with him. He just didn't have the grip going off into turn one to stay on his door. You have to believe maybe Brandon Bowie learned from that and might be able to do something just a little bit different here on this restart. If he can time it again and stay even with Colson when they get to turn one, he might be able to use that to his advantage and try to jump ahead and take the race lead away we've seen him have a lot of speed and be able to keep pace with Colson I believe if he gets out front he might be able to hold him off as well just taking a scan through the top 10 seeing if we've got any big movers David Washington has done a good job so far started this race in 16th position that is up to ninth however that being said nine of the drivers who started inside of the top 10 are still running inside of the top 10 that is all with the exception of the number 11 dylan jones who we documented having those problems while he was running in the number five spot that is exactly where he started so the fast cars in queue appear to be the fast car still to this point in race trim however just outside of the top 10 benefield he's passed 19 cars to go from 30th to 11th and lino calisto has got around 18 to go from 29th to 12th Keep an eye on those drivers as they try to crack those numbers inside of the top 10. Pace car going to drop down the green fly back out. And Bermudez finally going to get caught off at a restart. As we get back underway, Brandon Bowie going to power on the outside. And he'll go to the race lead. 
and that's exactly what Colson Bermudez was talking about when he said he did not like the restart box. And it's not only going to take the lead away from him, but could potentially take second away as Everhart was fighting to his outside, but just couldn't get the power down off of turn one and falls back in behind him. And now you see these guys fanning out down the long straightaway here, trying to make something happen. You see Comstock now right on the back bumper of Daniel Everhart. And these guys work to turn two, and Dwayne Vincent goes wide. I think he might have got shoved up the racetrack. Not sure who was behind him, but I'm pretty sure Dwayne Vincent got help as he went up the racetrack going off into the tunnel. And he's going to lose at least one spot, maybe two, as he's now battling side by side. And he makes contact with the guy in front of him. I have to believe that might have been a little bit of payback on the part of Dwayne Vincent. I believe that's Andrew Freenars right ahead of him. It is a mess behind him as they go three wide and it was the 49 was the driver who got into him. So I would imagine that that contact that time at turn three was not accidental. How about this? Three wide, two rows deep to corner number one. You got to wonder how much room do they have? The 87 really aggressive as Herlo tries to go through the middle. Not enough room. Big contact at a corner number one and a mess on the back straightaway. And it continues as you see more cars getting caught up in that. As they go down this back straightaway, you see Jonathan Cadell is caught up in it. Looks like the number 22 machine got a piece of that. Looking to see if any of our playoff contenders might have gotten a piece of it as well. I see the number 80. I believe that's 87 of Christopher Herlow. He was the one that initiated that wreck. So a big wreck here coming off of turn one. Takes out several drivers and creates a bit of chaos here on the back straightaway. Looks like at least seven, eight cars got caught up in that. Uh, looks like also the number 12 machine. I believe that is one of our playoff contenders. Ross Cato holding the cutoff spot right now. He also got a small piece of that. Cadell almost went up and over. If you, and you took a look at the replay there. The 87 I had the position. He was there by the time they came off for the corner. And if you look at it, you know, from straight behind. And you guys got a couple of different looks at that one from a few angles. So feel free to form your own opinion. But the 65 at the moment of contact comes up on the 87 but i think the question had more has to be in it's what the 13 expressed in his opinion over the radio is what herlow was doing in the middle there in the first place forced it three wide with the one in the 13 and it was really really tight by the time the contact happened he had the spot but it was a little bit gutsy getting into said position yeah, that's one of those calls where you can argue the point that Christopher Herlow was just going for it, trying to get everything he could on the restart because that's the best opportunity to pass. Then you can also argue that we haven't even made it to halfway. Uh, so it's just kind of a matter of which side are you on as far as how you want to call that one. One thing is for sure, though, that was a big wreck that took out a lot of cars. And uh, for Ross Cato, he got lucky. He didn't get more damage that he did. He, he suffered a little bit of damage to the right side of that car where he made contact. Uh, but fortunately for him, that car is not too terribly beat up he should be able to come in get the fenders beat out and be able to get back out on the racetrack and still be somewhat competitive so uh, a very lucky break for him in that respect as he's trying to hang on to that last spot in the playoffs he holds it coming into this race by just 15 points i believe it was over uh the uh number or number seven of nelson rivera so certainly just trying to hang on here with just six races remaining five after tonight just trying to see if he can get some points and try to hang on to that spot Brandon Bowie Bell took out the pit wall, but decides to stay out at the last moment. Drivers from maybe ninth on the back do decide to come down pit road. Uh, but Bowie is going to maintain the race lead. Jonathan Cadell, the driver who was on the inside of that three wide, and as you saw, is the driver who in the end came up on the two drivers on top of him, uh, will take the cause of that caution. And uh, through driver chat, letting everybody know that he had no clue they were, quote, three freaking wide. So... Um, he will take the responsibility for that one, but the explanation uh, lets you know what he thought about what kind of fight was going down there off of the restart. So I noted at the top of the broadcast that Pocono can go one of two directions. Last season, one caution. Two seasons ago, nine cautions. It may start to trickle towards the latter of those two as we are checked up now for a fourth time at lap 33. 
Yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be the trend that we're on. However, these guys have an opportunity still to get it going with just four cautions in the books. They can certainly still get this thing going. We saw them have a nice green flag run to start the race. They ran 10 laps green uh, with, before their first caution came out. So certainly these guys have it in them to go green flag for a while. And I believe we're about to hit a stretch where they're going to actually go ahead and do that. This is going to be an opportunity, though, Evan, for Colson Bermudez to redeem himself on this next restart. We saw on the most recent restart that uh, Brandon Bowie was able to catch him off guard with the uh, restart box being set up the way it is here, and he was actually able to take the lead away from Colson Bermuda. So now Colson has the opportunity to try to do the same thing back to Bowie, and you've got to believe he's certainly got that revenge on his mind. Well, and it definitely would upset him if he can get passed on the outside, but he cannot pass somebody on the outside of the restart. So hopefully, for his sake, he was able to learn enough on those couple of opportunities that, to, to be fair, uh, Bowie did have because he, I think that was the third time uh, that he restarted. Actually, I believe it was the second off of a uh, caution, but if you count the drop of the green flag for the first time, the third time of the night that he was starting to the outside of that driver, so uh, maybe practice makes perfect. You get tried out a couple of times and it eventually works out for it. So uh, that makes these things up. He goes to the outside of the racetrack and Bowie gonna be on the bottom and Bowie has to have some knowledge of what's gonna happen on the inside because he had to take that knowledge to make the move that he did on the top of the racetrack. So I think they're both in an unknown. And because of that, I think it would be hard for Bermudez to get this right back from Bowie. Yeah, I have to believe that Colson may need a couple of restarts out there like we saw with Bowie before he's going to be able to time it. However, we, we could be surprised. It's going to be exciting one way or another to see what happens on the restart between these two drivers. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily any animosity between them, but you have to believe that Bermudez is going to be fired up and trying to get everything he can on this next restart, which will make it a pretty exciting battle for the race lead, which has already been exciting for the most part of the night. These two have been bumper to bumper and trying to beat each other pretty much since the drop of the green flag. And you have to believe that battle is going to continue. I believe we're going to get the one to go this time by, uh, which means we're about to go back racing. We'll see here in about 45 seconds or so once these guys get around turn three and come back to the start finish line. If the lights go off on the pace car, that will mean we're going back green flag next time by. Uh, which would be pretty exciting to have, like you mentioned, not a lot of guys that have made their way up through the field, though, Evan, but one driver that is making his way up pretty nicely is Lionel Calisto. He started 29th. He took a provisional. He's up to 8th right now. He was 12th on the last restart, running just behind Adam Benefield. Calisto did not pit under this caution. I believe Benefield did. Will now drop back to 16th position. Benefield did pit under the yellow. He took on four tires. So for the first time tonight, not the majority of the field in a green. It's almost a 50-50 split on fresh tires and no tires. So that's something that, that we're going to have to keep an eye on as we narrow in on the halfway point of tonight's Pocono Mountains 200. I want to remind you that coverage of the Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series at LSR TV is brought to you by Joel Real Timing, the official timing software of LSR TV. Whether you spend your time on the sim from behind the wheel, on the pit box, or with the spotter stand, JRT is your go-to software for iRacing timing and scoring analytics. You can get yourself a basic download for free or get the pro version today online at joel-real-timing.com and because our friends at race spot tv are hosting our coverage of the rsr full throttle cup series tonight on iRacing live you can also go to race spot tv race spot tv forward slash timing if you want to get a live look in at timing have that up on a second screen as we get set to close in on the halfway point here tonight from long pond pennsylvania so we hit the reset button first time at colson bermudez is not going to be the control car see what that means everhart race high p3 behind them comstock is fourth and crowder inside of the top five as we head off to turn three and these drivers have been at the front for the majority of this race. And David Comstock is one of those drivers that is looking for a long green flag run. He tends to do better once they get out there and get spread out and get the tires really cooked down pretty good. Uh, so he wants this thing to get going and see if he can't get into a rhythm and get ahead of some of these guys. He showed a lot of speed on that first run at the beginning of the race. Now he starts fourth here on this restart and is going to try to challenge some of these guys as well. 
If they come double up, it's going to happen quick as the pace car drops down and in. 35 laps complete. Green flag flies as we go back underway. Bowie anticipated that one. And Bermudez is not happy about that one over the radio. Nonetheless, top three, single file to quarter number one. Side by side, P4 on that. And Brandon Bowie did what he had to do as the control car. He knew what was coming, and he decided to try to jump ahead of it just a little bit. You can't blame him for trying to play a little bit of defense there, and, and it worked out pretty well for him. As he is the race leader as they work down the long pond straightaway, trying to get ahead, and he's trying to pull away now from Colson Bermudez. We've seen all night long Colson has been able to get ahead for a few laps uh, on the restart, uh, but after the laps wind off, we saw Bowie starting to run him back down. Now the roles are reversed. Bermudez is going to have to try to run down Brandon Bowie and see if he can't get around him. And now the question is going to be, Evan Pasoko, will he use his tires up trying to get back to Bowie to where he might actually hurt himself over the course of the long run should we get one? And I think it's an honest question, too. Is that a clean restart by the 44? We talked about how Pocono is unique circumstances. It's different than other tracks, where when the pace car goes down, there's a good amount of time between the green flag where the race leader can go, and they would be going before the green, but after the pace car. I think if you look at the replay, there's zero doubt that Brandon Bowie was on the gas before the pace car dove down. He gained about 15 miles an hour from pace speed before the pace car started to make the left hand turn so I don't know how that would rule a read specifically in the rule book because again Pocado is a little bit tricky no pun intended compared to some of these other racetracks but Bermudez I think has a point well, and that's certainly something that he might be able to bring to the attention of some of the RSR admins, and they might be able to go back and look at it and determine that that was not a legal restart by Brandon Bowie. However, that's going to be up to those two drivers to decide what they're going to do with that. Right now, they've got to focus on trying to race their cars and get ahead of each other. And for Brandon Bowie, he's kept a pretty good gap here. He's got about three car lengths over Colson now as they come off turn one. But you see Daniel Eberhardt and Ashton Crowder right behind them trying to close that gap down as well. Uh, they're staying really close here and going after it here. I have to believe Everhart's looking for a long green flag run, too. He's one of those drivers as well uh, that tends to do better once they, they get a little strung out and he's able to get into a rhythm. So uh, we're seeing a lot of speed out of the number 90 car now. Uh, just imagine what's going to happen after a few laps. And he just got a second look at that restart. But Bermudez has done a pretty good job of hanging with him. He's only a couple of car lengths off, although here comes Everhart to the inside. So they'll go side by side for second position as Everhart clipped the fence a little bit further back. But new driver in second, Everhart to a race high P2 position for the driver of the number 90 machine. So despite that little bit of a brush up with the fence, I think he's going to be okay, and that's going to rearrange the top three in the running order. Just take a look here at the way that it's written in the RSR rulebook. The iRacing code um, will dictate the start, and quote, the leader can go any time the pace car starts it move to pit road. In my unprofessional opinion, the pace car didn't start its move to pit road. If that would be followed up and confirmed by race control, the possible penalty would be a stop and go black flag. So far, no word from the tower, and the 44 is pulling away as Everhart holds off the 14 of Bermudez, who, if he wasn't heated before, he definitely is now. Well, and I think you're seeing that that affect his uh, ability to race as we have a wreck on the front stretch here. Look, oh, big wreck down the front stretch. Not sure who that was, I Whitaker. believe. Uh, that was Whitaker down there in the back there. So a big wreck here uh, brings out yet another caution here at Pocono Raceway. And you're seeing the replay. We tried three wide. Uh, There's a little bit of two things. I think the 69 on the outside of him Street got sideways, but also I don't know if Whitaker thought that he was clear. He didn't go into the corner three wide, and he just came up to the point where I think even if the 69 kept her straight, he would have been there. And the 04 got sideways. Problem is he hooks back down the hill and that's with the 37 guest and a massive hit. The 37 of Bermanti and that is what made that a lot bigger than what it originally was. Yeah, unfortunate for Giovanni Bramante as he has already decided to call it a night. The motor was blown and they have already retired from the race. So unfortunate for them and for Brandon or Braden Whittaker. Uh, that could be the end of his night as well as that was a really hard hit to the left side of his car and could certainly have 
ended his night as well. Looks like he tried to drive away from it, but just wasn't doesn't have the motor. So I believe Braden, he's also going to be out of the uh, race for the evening. And I, I heard Colson Bermuda say across the radio that he wanted that to be looked at. So I think he was referring to the restart could potentially be something that the admins look at either after the race or possibly before it ends. 37 after that impact is going to take that car behind the wall. So his night is done and uh, Whitaker takes um, the cause of the caution. Uh, but he says that uh, no need to give him the black flag and the EOL penalty because his night is going to be done as well. So the two drivers who get a good look in that one are going to be done. And the onboard shot of the 37 just shows you how big of a hit it was. He was clear, clear, clear until the last minute. And once that car starts to come down in front of you, you're going almost 180 miles an hour coming off of the turn. You, you think maybe, okay, I'm going to turn the wheel to the left, and he, he's slotting closer and closer to the fence, Brian, so then you turn the wheel back to the right, and as soon as you second-guess yourself, that car's not turning either way, no matter what you do, and you just kind of jam yourself up and essentially drive straight into the guy. Well, and it's so hard to judge where a car is going to go, especially uh, when they're wrecking on a flat straightaway like here at Pocono. It's one thing when you're wrecking at a or in the corner on a high banked track because you know typically the car is going to hit the wall and then it's going to slide back down. Here at Pocono, the straightaway, the way it's set up, it's very flat. The cars typically may not slide around at all, or like in this case, we saw that Braden just didn't have the brake held as well as he could have, and that led to Giovanni Bramante just kind of being an innocent bystander and having nowhere to go. It if, if Braden had held the breakdown once that had happened, Giovanni would have made it through cleanly, and, and Braden, truthfully, probably wouldn't have been that bad off. He had the initial damage from when he got turned sideways coming off the corner, uh, but that was, for the most part, cosmetic and probably could have been fixed. As a result of what happened there, though, his night is over. So uh, just unfortunate circumstances for both of these drivers, uh, but they'll get back at it next week, and they'll be back out here trying to go for another victory. Drivers down pit road under the caution. It looks like Colson Bermudez is going to win the race off of pit road. I thought he might have beaten the 10 to the white. Don't believe so. And just listen it in because race control is talking about the restart from the last time. So I'll try to hear if I can uh, catch what uh, the admins were saying. If there's a penalty, I'll know for sure. But I know that race control was just addressing that restart over the chat. And I didn't catch all of what was said. But we did see a split strategy on the pit lane. It looks like iRacing is going to give the lead off of pit road to Eberhardt. Uh, but your race leader, Bowie, stayed out. He was bringing everybody down. He dove out at the last second, just like he did under the last yellow. This time, though, not everybody followed him. Yeah, it looks like Nick Silver, Austin Coop, and then Shane Ewing, John Abbott, all elected to stay on the track. Christopher Hurlow as well. So a handful of drivers electing to stay on the track with Brandon Bowie. Looks like five in total, maybe six, actually six, yes, uh, will stay on the racetrack unless they elect to come to pit road this time by which means that Daniel Everhart, if everybody stays on the track, would start in seventh. So we're just going to have to wait and see what happens here, see if any of these drivers elect to come to pit road as they come off turn three. We're watching to see if any of them will. It looks like a couple will. It looks like John Abbott and Christopher Hurlow will come to pit road as long, along with a couple of cars behind them as well. Never mind. They're going to just have fun with the pit cone and see if they can't go out there and hit it without hitting the wall. That was Ashton Crowder in the 27. So uh, that's going to move Everhart up to the fifth position when they go back green on this restart it's going to be a little bit more of a tricky restart for these drivers though is now they're going to have to work through more than just one car that stays out on old tires we saw it earlier when austin coop was the only driver on old tires now they're going to have to get past four that's going to be a little bit more difficult than it was when it was just one and the drivers who stay out here with silver Coop, Ewing, those three drivers, I believe, and not able to check to confirm, but we did have a split decision, the last caution flag, where uh, we saw Bowie fake out to the pit lane, jump back out, and I think it was about the top nine or so decided to stay out with him. I believe that Silver, Coop, and Ewing just looked at it based on where they were starting and where they were running, were a part of those drivers who pitted. So in effect, you got three strategies going on. And the strategy works out pretty good for the 6, the 32, and the 90. By pitting last time, you can stay out this time. For those drivers who pitted last time and this caution, you're probably going to end up losing spots. So you're going to have Bowie on the oldest tires has not pitted in either of the last two cautions. Then you've got Silver Cupidoo and who we assume have pitted not this yellow, but the yellow prior. And then Eberhardt, fifth, 
Bermuda and sixth, so on and so forth. Those drivers are all going to be on the fresh four Goodyear tires. Those are the guys that are going to really have the speed, but there, as you noted, a couple of rows of cars to get to before they get to the 44. I do think, though, that Bowie is going to be at a big disadvantage. And as the race leader, not to armchair quarterback it, but if he, if he went down pit road, I wouldn't have been surprised, Brian, if the guys behind him jumped out. So you're kind of screwed if you do and screwed if you don't up front. And unfortunately, that's part of being the race leader. We'll see what Bowie can do, though, about it. Well, and I don't think he's in ba as bad a shape as, as maybe he could have been. They only had four laps on the tires uh, when this caution came out and they elected to come back to pit road. Five if you include the previous restart where they barely got up to speed before the caution came back out. So uh, I, I think he's going to be okay here. The one thing he's also going to have in his favor is that he's going to be able to have a couple of laps to try to build a gap between him and the drivers that are on fresher tires. Because for Daniel Eberhardt, for Colson Bermudez, and all these drivers behind him that are on fresher tires, they're not going to be able to get through these guys easily. Or I guess I shouldn't say that. Uh, they're going to have their work cut out for him to get through these guys uh, and get to Brandon Bowie. They should take at least a lap and a half to maybe two laps to be able to get to that second and third position. And I think that's going to be enough to allow Bowie to try to get away. And by that point, I think the tires will have evened out enough to where he probably won't be in too bad a shape. We'll see what happens off of this restart across the halfway point in this race. So at a moment, once everybody gets up to speed, we will take a look at our iRacing Midway Race break. But for now, the focus is on the restart and all eyes specifically on the 44 now after a little bit of a controversial restart the last time around. We'll see when that 44 goes in relation to the pace cars. Round into turn two again. You got to wait for the pace car to drop down, make a movement to the pit lane you cannot change your speed until that happens at most tracks you get maybe four seconds tops here you get maybe half so it's if they're the 44 you're really trying to watch where that pace car is and to this point i think you've got a pretty good idea of when it's going to drop down based on how far down the straightaway it goes until it dives down and you're trying to guess it. We'll see just how accurate the number 44 can be. So here comes the field coming out of quarter number three. Pace car going to duck down to the lane with 44 laps complete from Pocado. Pace car is down. And we waited a lot longer on that one. He still gets a good jump. No green flag flies. And we go back underway. The 24 is silver. Right there. Not going to be on the outside. Though I believe the top two will be single file. Yes, they are as the 44 comes up. And Eberhardt did not get a good restart either. He's going to get shuffled back just a little bit as they now go three wide through turn one. You've got Eberhardt on the bottom, Bermuda's in the middle, and Shane Ewing on the outside. A little bit of contact between Colson and Shane Ewing, but they're going to settle it cleanly as Bermuda's now will move ahead into that fourth position. He was able to jump ahead of Eberhardt after losing that spot on pit road. Now he sets his sights on Austin Coop. Gets a good run through the tunnel, almost makes contact with Coop, and now looks to the inside as they head to turn three. 14, taking no prison. Visitors. Gonna go all the way up alongside the six and he will get that position up to third. So how about the pitch strategy? Maybe gonna give the 14 his opportunity at Vengeance. Not done yet though. Had a little bit of a bobble inside of the corner and Coop with a great run on the outside is actually gonna get that position at the start finish line by one one thousandth of a second. So just when I called that for the 14 of Bermuda as a small mistake brought the six back into it. Coop really high in turn number one to give it to the gate just four here comes Everhart now through the inside uncontested pass at Austin Coop to move him up to fourth position leading two cars on fresh tires and you see these guys now they're trying to work their way closer to Nick Silver here who's got a pretty good run going now he was uh, involved in an accident just a handful of laps ago was spinning around coming off of the tunnel turn now he's trying to chase down Brandon Bowie for the race lead he's staying very close and showing a pretty good amount of speed right now but his problem now becomes the 14 as Colson Bermudez has closed that gap down to less than two car lengths and is trying to carry that speed down the long straightaway here to see if he can't go after the race lead and for second place as he is trying to challenge Nick Silver. Uh, he's still got a little bit of work cut out for him as Brandon Bowie and Nick Silver are actually doing a pretty good job here, Evan, at holding on to these couple of positions on this restart. Bermudez is going to get a run this time, but one, he will look to the inside, and we're going to see a side-by-side -side fight for second to the tunnel turn. Does the 14 stick the nose in there? Yes, he does. 
to get a good door to door. Inside the place to be, move Bermudez up to second. Here comes Everhart. He'll also follow through on the inside and relatively easily, he will go up to third position. 24 not going to be able to fight back on the outside. And now, Silver might be in a compromising position for the 27 to crown right there. But yeah, Bowie and Silver, to be honest, even though the 24 just lost those two spots, did a pretty good job off for the restart of defending against the 14 and the 90. Those fresh tires were going to be their best, obviously, the first lap off for the restart. And I think it helped both of them that Bermudez and Everhart weren't able to quickly get through the traffic. That kind of slowed them up a little bit. Now that they're clear and they have the 44 in their sights, what do those second and third place cars do? Well, I think certainly just keep doing what they've been doing. They've shown that they've got fresher tires and they're able to carry that speed a little bit better than Nick Silver uh, and the rest of the drivers that they were working their way around. But the problem is they haven't actually really closed a whole lot on Brandon Bowie. It looks like they got a pretty good run through the tunnel right there and was able to close down that gap a little bit. But Bowie's doing a really good job. And the longer this run goes, the more even the tires are going to become. But we saw Colson Bermudez, he carried a tremendous amount of speed down into turn three and was able to really close that gap down and now as you see them fan out down the front straightaway it looks like Brandon Bowie is trying to break the draft Bowie got a good run up off the corner and was able to kind of drive away from Colson here uh, so he's still doing a really good job at managing this race lead and keeping a pretty steady gap over Colson and Daniel Everhart who are on the fresh tires and you also see Nick Silver he's hung on in fourth place really well as well have to think though that a move for the top spot's going to be coming in about a lap or two. They're right on the doorstep. Two and a half. Now two car lengths. As you can see the 14, just how much quicker he got into the tunnel turn. 44 just a tad bit faster off. But Ramita has made up about a car length in that section of the racetrack alone. Once again, drives it in harder to quarter number three. It would give Bowie a better exit off of the turn might be the better strategy for him based on how the straightaways are and Bermudez is in the fence. He pushed too hard, tags the wall, and that's going to give Everhart at least P2 as the 14 struggle now all the way to turn one. Well, and you have to wonder if that is still a little bit of frustration on the part of Colson Bermudez from losing the, re the lead on one of the restarts earlier on in the race. Uh, he's been pushing hard ever since that moment, just trying to get back to Brandon Bowie. And you've got to believe he felt like this was his opportunity being on fresher tires, that he could get back up there and take back what he felt like was still rightfully his, and that was the race lead. Now he's got some damage to the right side of that car, and he's probably just a little bit more frustrated. But that's not the issue now, as Everhart carried a great run through turn two and is right on the back bumper of Brandon Bowie. He runs wide in turn three, trying to carry speed off the corner, and he's looking to the outside for the lead. Is he going to be able to get there? No, he's not, but he gets a good run up off the corner, and that could be a problem for Brandon Bowie. As now they go side by side at the start finish line, Everhart looks to the inside for the lead as they head to one. 50 laps complete for the Pocono to Raceway, down to 30 laps to go as we go side by side for the race lead. Daniel Eberhardt started in eighth position and has been working his way up all race long. A little bit loose though, the inside of turn one. It'll be neck and neck down the long pond straightaway. Looks like the dining machine though can't keep the bite off for the corner. Bowie clears him as they head back off to turn number two. They've got a little bit of a gap back to a very busy Colson Bermudez, who after getting into the fence has invited Nick Silver, Ashton Crowder, Dylan Jones, just to name a few, right up to his bumper. So they're sitting about a second away from the battle for the race lead that continues. Now Everhart tries the outside line. It should give him a good run off of the quarter as he close enough to take advantage. And I believe the answer is no. He's not quite close enough to be able to get to Brandon Bowie and try to make that move to the inside once again. Uh, as they did a lap ago down into turn one. And one thing I don't think we've been talking about, I know we haven't talked about actually, is that these drivers are shifting down in turn one. They're kicking it from fourth gear down to third gear, which allows them to be able to carry more speed up off the corner. They're able to get the RPMs up, get some more traction in the tires, and be able to get off the corner quicker than if they were in fourth gear. And I think that's what helped Bowie be able to hold off Daniel Everhart. He was on the outside line. He already had him pinched down. When he shifted down into third gear, he was able to pick up the throttle a little bit quicker and was able to drive away and ultimately hold on to the race lead. And now he's actually put a gap on Daniel Daniel Everhart by about six, seven car lengths here. Uh, in just this last lap, Everhart had a pretty rough lap and is starting to lose ground. And you have to wonder if the Dynamo Machine about to used up some of his equipment trying to get around the guy up in front. You can see the 44s going down to the inside, back up to the outside on the straights, trying to break that draft. It is a factor at a track that is as large 
as the Pocono Raceway. We've passed the halfway point in this race by a good bit, but didn't want to cut away from the battle for the race lead. Now that there's a small gap, let's take a look top to bottom at your iRacing the Midway Race Break, brought to you by iRacing, the leading online racing simulation developed from the beginning as a centralized racing and competition service. iRacing organizes, hosts, and officiates races on virtual tracks all around the globe. And in the fast-paced world of esports, iRacing is your one-stop shop for online racing with officially sanctioned series by the likes of NASCAR, IndyCar, IMSA, the World of Outlaws, and more. Brandon Bowie, your race leader at lap number 53, started in second position. He leads over Daniel Everhart, who runs P2, and Ashton Crowder, who is now up to third. Jones up to fourth as Cole Sitter Bermudez. Cole Sitter continues to struggle. He's fallen to fifth in the last couple of laps and may lose another. Nick Silver, who was sixth the last time by, not all that far back either. David Washington has made his way up from 16th position. Your points leader is at seventh spot right now. The 88th of Andrew Farnars is in the number eight position. Justin Lizardby is ninth, and David Comstock rounds out your top ten. Shane Ewing, one of those drivers trying to make their way into the playoffs. He sits in the 11th position. Then Lionel Calisto, another one. He's on the outside looking in, coming into tonight. He's in 12th. Nelson Rivera, another one of those drivers trying to make their way into the playoffs. He sits 13th right now. Then we have Sean Boundy in 14th. Andrew Bird is 15th. Then the guy that won all the way back at Daytona, Trevor Rapallo, sits in the 16th position. Then we have Joseph LaPlaca, Nathan Little, John Abbott, and Austin Coop running out the top 20. Four more drivers on the lead lap that includes a torn up number 13 to Dwayne Vincent who started this race in seventh way back in 21st. Corey Wolf runs in the number 22 spot. Austin Coop pitting from 23rd. That'll drop him to 24th. So give Ross Cato 23rd and Coop 24th. There is one driver that is one lap off of the lead lap and that is Christopher Herlow. Minus a back bumper at all. That Lowe's entry is still running in 25th. Other than that, everybody else towards the back out of this race that includes Corbin Hempstreet, Braden Whitaker, Giovanni Bramante, Gabe Wood, and Sean Casto to 30th. And 31st goes to Jonathan Goodell. Then we have Tanner Tallarico, Carl Shedd, Randy Yoakum, Douglas Wyatt, and Michael Priester running out the 36 car field here tonight. And we have the leader on pit road. But this concludes your iRacing Midway race break. For more information on the wide variety of sim racing possibilities online, visit iRacing.com to sign up today. For a limited time, you can visit iRacing.com forward slash World of Outlaws and take advantage of exclusive promo codes to get yourself on the sim with a one-year membership for half the price. And what a deal that is. Back to the action here at Pocono Raceway, though, Evan Pasoko. Brandon Bowie is the first of our leaders on pit road for what we assume to be the final time and a scheduled pit stop for the number 44 machine. You can make it from this point to the end, and I like the call because he came down pit road just as we were wrapping up your look through the 36 drivers in this race. The 90 was right there. The 27 was right there. I like the call to come to pit road, and the short pit means that he's going to have fresher tires now. So the longer Eberhardt, Crowder, Jones, Bermudez, and company stay out, in theory, that's going to be time that he's gaining on them. The risk is obviously that when you pit, you run the risk of maybe losing your lead lap status. Bowie, having been running up front and in the race lead at the time, has not lost his lead lap status, which is very good news for him. So I think he's in a good spot. Well, the advantage to where he did it is as the race leader and having 55 to 60 seconds uh, to get around this racetrack, depending on how long the tires have been wore out. We saw these guys running about 54 second laps uh, when that when he made the move to pit road. Uh, he was able to come in and only lose a little bit of time. And actually, I think I was looking at it. He might have taken two tires on that pit stop as well, which could also have helped his situation as well. I'm going to go back and look at that right now. Uh, but... Uh, no, actually, he did go ahead and take four tires, so he just got a really good stop and was able to get out there and get back out on the track pretty cleanly, uh, but still a really good moment for him. Uh, this puts him in a spot where he can get use the fresh tires, try to get away from some of these drivers, and then just run some laps for a while, as now we have Ashton Crowder also on pit road, Evan Pasoko. He gives up the number two spot, which means that Eberhardt's still your race leader. Dylan Jones is up to second, and Bermudez has once again assumed third spot after having two drivers in front of him come down pit road. Again, he had fallen to fifth position when we last checked in with the driver of the number 14 machine. So for Eberhardt, again, the longer you stay out, the more time you lose to the likes of Bowie. 
However, you'll then have the tire advantage to the end of this run. You're slower now, you're losing time. As soon as you get fresher tires, you're gonna have the better end of the draw. When does he decide to pit? The answer is now. Lap number 58, Everhart is going to pit. So will Colson Bermudez, who comes in from third. Not getting Dylan Jones to bite though. The ages Ford will stay out. He's now your race leader. And as we watch Everhart and Colson Bermudez come to pit road for what we assume to be their final pit stops of the evening, doing this under green, you have to be completely flawless. We saw early in the race, David Comstock made a mistake under caution. He was able to rebound from that. If you make a mistake under green, it's going to be a lot harder for you to rebound from that mistake. So far, both of these drivers have a perfect pit stop on pit road, four tires and down and away for Daniel Everhart. And Colson Bermudez is also working on his left side tires, and he too is now down and away. But as you see that them exit pit road that's brandon Bowie. it's going around into turn one with a pretty good advantage over these drivers uh he's already got about half of turn one uh over top of these drivers ashton crowder also made his way past them as well so a pretty good advantage for Bowie. uh you see just how much the tires meant uh for him trying to get out there just a couple of laps before everybody else and get to pit road he was able to get ahead by about a second over ashton crowder about two and a half back to the eberhardt and that's a perfect view of those three and how that pitch strategy works that we were talking about. Brandon Bowie pitted before Ashton Crowder. He got on fresher tires before Ashton Crowder. He's in front of him. Ashton Crowder pitted before Daniel Everhart did. He's on fresher tires before Everhart got him. He runs in front of Everhart on the racetrack. However, their speed now going to be in reverse order. The fresher tires to Everhart, then followed up by Crowder and then Bowie. But I have to think the track position is good news for the 44. And seeing that... The 11 machine of Dylan Jones has got to be coming down pit road. This time, but a cooter number three, he will. He'll drop to the inside. The 11 is headed pit side. David Washington is going to pit from second. The 88 machine has had quite an evening. He's going to assume the race lead now. Yeah, and talking about Andrew Friedarch, he has had a very eventful evening. Uh, has a little bit of damage on that car, just trying to get around here and, and try to see if he can't uh, steal something. If he can catch a caution and be able to hold on to this track position, he'd be in a pretty good spot, possibly be able to hang on to the lead. As you see David Comstock right behind him, he's going to have an issue. He got a little sideways coming up off the corner and is going to have to heed that position to Lionel Callisto. So these are your top three right now. As Dylan Jones has gotten off of pit road cleanly, he got his four tires and is down and away, but he too has given up a ton of time to the leaders ahead of him as he is all uh, he's going into turn one as all of the other leaders have already made their way off of turn one and are heading down the long pond straightaway. 97 to Kalisto got into the wall at a turn number two, and it was a spectacular slide off of the corner for David Comstock. I don't know if we can get a look at that. The 42 in corner two at lap 61, right behind the 97 tagging the fence. He was so sideways and somehow avoided the wall, went to the inside and got around him. That was some fantastic stuff, courtesy David Comstock. Well, and, and Comstock is one of those drivers that somehow can just pull those types of moves off all the time and be able to make it work. And one thing I just went back and looked at, uh, the fuel window is anywhere from 31 to 35 laps uh, on a tank of gas. Well, if you do the math, David Comstock came in under that last caution, which was on lap 42. They went back green on lap 44. That'd be 36 laps. Same thing for Andrew Freenars. He, too, was on pit road. Could we see one of these drivers maybe try to stretch it to the end and go all the distance? And the answer is no for David Comstock, as he is coming to pit road right now. But for Andrew Freenars, he stays out on the racetrack for at least another lap. Uh, it could be interesting to see should one of these drivers decide to try to make that call. He has 27 seconds to the Brandon Bowie, who's the first driver out to on fresh tires in the number 11 spot. So it's not impossible to think they might be able to do something. I think that the surefire way to make it is to get a caution and then save fuel. But at that point, if a yellow's coming out, people are going to be coming down for tires. So that might even work out better for the drivers running first through ninth position on track, or rather now eighth position, as Bowie goes up to ninth as he gets around the 12 of Cato, so he'll actually jump up to eight. So for the top seven, they could just get a yellow right now. They'd get back on cycle, because everybody else would pit, and they'd be now in the top seven. Don't think it's gonna happen. Obviously, one of the most treacherous points in a race is during a pit cycle. You got guys on old tires, you got guys on fresh tires. You saw what Comstock's car was like on old tires. So never say never, but slowly that hope is fading. 
Well, and while we look at that, I have to look at what could be the battle for the race lead should all these guys elect to come to pit road, and that's between Brandon Bowie and Ashton Crowder. Crowder has ran down Bowie and is now side by side with him as they come off turn three. He got a great run coming up off the corner and is going to try to pin Vin or Bowie up to the outside line and see if he can't carry that speed down the front straightaway to try to clear him. If these other drivers can't make it to the end on fuel, this would be your battle for the lead and possibly for the win. And Ashton Crowder fighting hard on the inside line but Bowie fights back. He's going to try to carry some speed up off the corner, gets a good run up off, and is trying to battle back and see if he can't get ahead of him before they get to the tunnel. This is not where he wants to be on the outside line. The advantage will go to Crowder as they head to the tunnel turn. Donnie Eberhardt sits behind and watches as they go side by side and battle for seventh spot right on each other's door. Here comes the 90 all the way to the inside. Three wide for what may become the race win from Pocono. Freshest tires on the inside to the oldest on the outside. And that is exactly how the corner is going to work out. Eberhardt trying to drag race to the start finish line. The 27 fights back up top and it'll be Crowder at the start finish line by one 1,000th, but Eberhardt's not giving up. Danandi does not have the preferred lane as he tries to look to the bottom and he gets cleared. So the 44 opened up a gap off of pit stops by pitting first and put himself on the fresh tires first. However, out of these three, the guy who pitted last has the newer tires, and that's Everhart. And you remember how far spread apart they were when they all met back up? Well, this is exactly why they're all together now. Yeah, and for Brandon Bowie, this is not what he expected to happen. I have to believe is now he's beginning to fade as Everhart stays right on the back bumper of Ashton Crowder. He now goes to the outside in turn three, tries to carry that speed. We've seen Everhart do that all night long. One of the few guys up in the front of the pack that's been doing that, and he continues that trend, but he did not get the run up off the corner he was looking for there as Ashton Crowder was able to drive away by about a half a car length and continues to pull away down this front straightaway. He's trying to get away from him because he knows that Everhart has about two lap fresher tires than him and could potentially be able to run him down and take that position away. This again could be the battle for the lead and ultimately for the win. We have to wait and see what's going to happen with Andrew Freenars along with Andrew Bird. Adam Benefield and Joseph LaPlaca and I believe possibly Dwayne Vincent as well as he's actually, yeah, he's got some damage and he's being passed by these drivers right now. Uh, so for the front four, we're waiting to see if they're able to make it to the end on fuel or if they're not going to make it and they're just waiting for a caution. And even if they can stay out on fuel, say that they're all going to be able to make it to the end. Last time by Ashton Crowder was two seconds faster than your race leader. This time by, 14 laps to go in this race. He's only 23 seconds back, and if you get two seconds a lap, that's 28 seconds. So it's still, even if they could make it, would be tight, and that wouldn't even give the guys up front any opportunity to back off even more to save fuel. Caution, flag flies at lap number 67. That's what those four were banking on, and it's problems on the front straightaway. Yeah, and that's exactly like you mentioned what those four drivers that were still out there on the racetrack were looking for. And for Christopher Herlow, uh, actually, I don't believe that was uh, his fault. Looks like Justin Lizaby might have had an issue uh, on the front stretch. Not really sure what happened, but ultimately that brings out a caution here and does bring these guys to the conclusion that they're going to have some track position. Evan Pasoko, they're going to be able to go up there and try to steal this thing at the end of it. And Lizzie to be apologizing over the radio to Comstock for getting loose, but and and the 42 came over the radio as well when against it happened, and obviously wasn't happy and said you can thank the 31 for that one, but unless they had some sort of agreement, agreement, you know, going on that the 31 was to let the 42 by, I saw Comstock get loose and get up into him. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at here. It just looks like Comstock just... Listen, he just took the cause of the caution, so he, he's claiming responsibility for it, and they don't seem to be disagreeing that the 31 is responsible, but I don't know if I'm looking at a different lap, but I saw the 42 go up nonetheless. A rare mistake on Comstock's behalf. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I don't I don't feel like if I'm Justin Lizenby that I would have claimed that caution per se. I think that was more so the 42's fault than anything because he gets a little sideways coming up off the corner and just can't control the car and slides up and hits the door of the 31. I mean, it looks like maybe Justin got a little sideways off the corner, but 
I think that pales in comparison to how sideways Comstock was. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, Justin elected to take that caution. Uh, so there's no review there for the admins to have to worry about. Now we have to worry about pit stops here as the leaders are getting ready to come in. And it looks like Andrew Freenarge is going to be the one leading the charge down. Now the question becomes, Evan Pasoko, if you are a driver like Brandon Bowie or Daniel Eberhardt, Ashton Crowder, do you take two tires to try to get your track position back? Or you t do you take four and then hope that you can battle your way back through this field? Well, for the guys at first and second, they started inside at the top 10. I think they've got a decent car to work with, but it's exactly what those four wanted. And if you were just lapped by those guys coming back up to the field and you finally decided the pit man, it sings that you did not stay out and maintain in the top four. Nonetheless, it's a new race. Drivers down pit road. Looks like a handful going to go with four tires. Race off for the pit lane amongst those is going to be won by the 14. Bermudez. Going with right side tires only. That was an audible call, Brian. He overshot the box. Backed up. Had to go with two tires only. I like the call because if he had to back up and go with four, he might have done what we saw happen to Comstock earlier, and that's lose eight positions. So I think the intention was to go with four. He ends up with two because he overshoots the pit box. But that wasn't the only bit of strategy on the pit lane we did see david washington plan for two and take two and win the race off of pit road way back from about 11th position when he pitted well and this certainly will shake things up at the front of the field because now we're going to be talking about a handful of drivers that we haven't talked about much at all tonight we th this is kind of strange on my part because i've been here for most of the races i know evan you haven't been but for david washington we haven't said his name hardly at all other than at the beginning when we were showing the starting lineup and when we did the midway race break other than that i don't really know that we've called his name all night long this is our points leader that we haven't really talked about all night long and he had to take two tires to get in a position to go up here and win the race he has not had the night at all that he was looking for uh, but now he has an opportunity to close this thing out and possibly go out there and get yet another victory here in the full throttle cup series he's going to have his work cut out for him though because he's got a host of drivers behind him that are going to be looking to try to take that away from him and that begins with colson bermudez who took two tires as well but has some right side damage could play a factor in his restart as well uh, because he's going to have that issue and actually i'm looking up here looks like christopher herlow actually he's trying to take the wave around uh so not really a factor there but uh, this is going to be a very interesting restart nonetheless the four drivers up at the front go with two tires it's going to be david washington in first colson bermudez in second trevor Rapolo in sixth and sean boundy in seventh those drivers two only everybody else going to go with four tires but you got washington in first Bermudez in second. You got the 88 Machine of Farnes in third. It's ages, ages, ages towards the front of the field trying to lock this one up. And despite the fact that the end of this race has appeared to fall apart for Bermudez, he's back in a pretty good spot. I think he might be kicking himself over the mistake on Pit Road. Um, I'm not sure he would have been able to beat the 88 off of Pit Road if they both went with uh, four tires. But nonetheless, he's kind of forced himself into a place to go with two all those guys up front curious just how much cooperation will be going on amongst the three of them come the restart well and you have to believe with them being teammates there's certainly going to be a little bit of cooperation because uh the aegis drivers have done a really good job all season long at helping each other out on these restarts and throughout the course of races you have to believe they're going to be communicating with one another on this restart to try to make sure they each get away cleanly and try to get single file as quickly as possible so that at least one of them can try to come away with the victory the problem is they have a bunch of drivers behind them on four fresh tires and i believe that four fresh tires is going to be a pretty big difference maker considering how many laps are on the two left side tires uh, that these three at the front have I think if you're looking back there, the one driver I'd be the most concerned about right now is Adam Benefield. He's going to be, uh, I believe, the second car out on four fresh tires, and he's shown a, a pretty good amount of speed tonight. Just hasn't had the track position, uh, but I believe on this restart, he's one to look out for. You get an idea of just how many laps are going to be left in this race as the lights go out on top of the pace car. So a restart will come with 71 laps complete and what would be just nine laps left to go the next time by. That leaves the window open if we were to see a caution and the four laps off for the restart. 
to then have another restart. But if you get a yellow inside of the final five laps of this race, not enough time to go through a caution to flag cycle and restart. So it is a race essentially first to five to go, then to the white flag, where once you get to that point, does it matter if an incident happens on the racetrack, first driver back to the checkers takes home the win, and then a race to the checkered flag. So if you're sitting on four tires, if you're that number 88 machine to the 14, and, and however all of this is going to shake out, you cannot wait, especially those on the fresh tires. There's no waiting and saying, okay, I'm a second back. Let me get two tenths a lap. You're not working your way down to the checkered flag. You're going for it. This is it. This could be it. This may be the final restart. And that's exactly how you have to approach it. You have to believe that this is going to be the final opportunity to go after it and try to get some positions and ultimately go after the race win. If you're David Washington, you've got to be on the loud pedal as quickly as possible. Try to get away from these drivers. Try to get away from the ones on four fresh tires and hope that you can hold on. Hope that your teammates can try to hold these guys off long enough for you to be able to win this race. David Washington has already won, I believe, three times this season. So not really any concerns there, but definitely would like to get another one. For what could be the final time tonight, the pace car is going to duck out it in, and the field is in the hands of one David Washington. 14 alongside, green flag flies as we go back underway, side by side on the front row. And Colson Bermudez did exactly what had happened to him earlier in the race. He timed that restart and is going to be able to try to inch ahead of David Washington as they head to turn one. Dave now goes to the bottom of the racetrack trying to pull away. Uh, but Colson Bermudez fights back on the outside line. Now they make contact with the corner. And that shows Benefield to the bottom three wide. And there's a big wreck on the back stretch here. Caution comes out just as the 14, who restarted in second position, clears David Washington, and that will give us one final restart. It is big problems down and at a quarter number one, though. It all started, looks like side by side, four wide action up in front. Does not end well. The 58, the 24, the 11 all get together and we're about three or four rows behind, there was nowhere to go, and that's a lot of race cars. And oh, Austin Coop, he took a hard hit to the inside Armco barrier coming off of that corner. He got clipped uh, by one of the cars that was wrecking. I believe that was Nick Silver that got a piece of him. Uh, actually, it looks like that was Dylan Jones uh, that shoved him hard into the Armco barrier, and, and one of the hardest hits we've seen uh, on sim racing here in recent times. Uh, just an unfortunate circumstance there. Uh, but how about David Comstock somehow making his way through that wreck without catching up or getting caught up in that? He was right behind that, basically in the eye of the storm. And he just stayed calm and was very patient working his way through the wreck. And he came through without a scratch. And the brutal irony in, in this incident, kind of like it always is at a plate track, is the driver who starts the accident is the driver who drives away free, and, and Eberhardt didn't turn anybody, he didn't hit anybody, in fact, I don't even think he got any piece of contact in that at all, but it was his car who got sideways in front of the 11 that forced the 11 of Jones to try to move high, and it collected the 15, the 24, so the driver who kicked off the incident, although not being a part of what eventually happened, is able to drive away and maintain 10th. The guys behind him aren't as fortunate. Yeah, and that, that's just one of those deals. Like you said, uh, Dylan Jones was trying to react to something that was happening in front of him, and it just created a chain reaction effect that led to the wreck that we saw. And uh, that's an unfortunate circumstance that happens in racing from time to time. It's very hard uh, to, to try to manipulate your way through an incident like that. We talked about it earlier in the race with Giovanni Bramante. He had, made, had to make a decision which direction was he going to go. Well, that was the same thing. Uh, that we just saw there for Dylan Jones. And unfortunately, he, there's really no right decision in that situation. It's just a matter of hoping that it works out in your favor when it's all said and done. And unfortunately for Dylan and a host of others, it just wasn't quite that way. Just taking a couple looks at, at this incident, somebody ended up up and over the inside wall and actually ended up getting kicked back to the pit lane um, without, uh, I guess, an option of if they were intending on taking the toe to pit road. That was the six of Austin Coop who got into that Armco and Shades of Elliott Sadler ended up going up and over that Armco barrier into the grass. And that is, uh, without, I think, having to be said, going to end Austin Coop's night. So we said that it may have been the final restart on the night. 
answer is it was not. We are going to get one last dash towards the end of this one, and a lot happened in that short period between the start and finish on and the restart box and the set of recorders one and two. Colson Bermudez went from second to the race lead, and Andrew Bird, who restarted in fourth position, takes over second. David Washington, control car on that last one, fell to third. Well, and that just goes to show you that how fast Colson Bermudez has been all night long. He was able to take advantage of that restart and really able to go somewhere. But one thing worth noting, I just went back and looked because I was curious. Andrew Bird was a one of those drivers that took four tires on that most recent pit stop. And now he gets to start on the front row. Of course, like we mentioned, we only have one more opportunity to go back green. If we have another caution after the restart, they will not get another opportunity. So this is it for Andrew Bird. He's going to have to get everything he can on this restart to try to take this thing away from Colson Bermuda. Uh, but we saw, as you mentioned, he restarted fourth. With those four fresh tires, he was able to climb all the way up to second very quickly. So he's certainly seen how much quicker those four tires are than the two. He's definitely going to be charging here on this next restart. We'll see just when that restart's going to come up. Lights on top of the pace car do not yet go out. So the next time by 75 laps going to be complete. We'll take lap number 76. If the lights go out on top of the pace car, then it will be a two-lap shootout and an impromptu shot at overtime. Although we're not going over the time allotted scheduled in this race. It'll be a two-lap shootout, what used to be known as a green-white checker in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series. Restart going to be with about 20 cars total scored on the lead lap one thing that we said very early on when we were introducing you to this Pocono Raceway is the uniqueness of the facility turn one based off of the defunct Trenton Speedway at 14 degrees turn three is the least banked at just six degrees it's also the widest corner that one based off of the Milwaukee Mile but turn two the tunnel turn as it's most commonly referred to eight degrees based off of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway your race leader won at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the first time this season, what a week ago. I think it'd be kind of fitting if he, if we can see him in some sort of exciting fight in turn two and him get the upper hand of that. Yeah, absolutely. Two in a row would certainly be what Colson Bermudez is looking for, and, and never mind the fact uh, that he needs to try to get a little bit closer in points to try to make that playoff spot. They've got him shown in the playoff grid right now because they uh, feel pretty comfortable he's going to make it into the top 30 in points, but he's not actually in there yet. More than likely will be there after tonight as he's not, only got a little ways to go, I believe about 15 points or so to climb up to that point, and he will be there, I'd say, pretty comfortably after tonight is over. But I don't think the battle for him is over quite yet because he's got four tires to his outside, and we've already seen tonight these guys know how to try to snooker the leader on the restart. You have to believe Andrew Bird has been sitting back watching. He's been up inside the top ten for much of the race, so he's had a pretty good view of what's been going on on the front row. Now he gets one only one opportunity to try to steal this thing away from Colson Bermudez. Last time he brought us back to the green flag, Brandon Bowie beat him on the restart on the outside lane. Caution flag quickly came thereafter. We went back to green flag conditions after that. Bowie that was in control had that controversial restart in which nothing came of. And Bermudez at that moment wasn't feeling too hot. Fell to fifth on that green flag stretch, lost three of those spots in that fall to fifth in one lap around this two and a half mile triangle. Now he has an opportunity to be able to wash all that away. Doesn't have to care. Nothing happened to the 44. Doesn't have to care that he blew that one restart as long as it remains as that one restart. Last time he was in this position, he could not execute the restart. He's got to do it this time and Bird may not be as poised as Bowie was when Bowie made that move because Bowie had a couple of opportunities. Three restarts total on the outside to kind of get the hang of things. 49 in uncharted territories, so he's really going to have to take a swing at it, try to guess the timing. And we're just going to have to wait and see what happens here. You see he's trying to get ready, get prepared for this restart. And the one thing that he's got going in his favor is even if he doesn't necessarily get it going on the restart, he's got four fresh tires where the two guys behind him, David Washington, Andrew Freenars, they're on two. And he knows the leader's on two as well. If he doesn't get it right on the restart, he's going to have opportunities as long as we don't get another caution uh, before he has an opportunity to pounce. That's the one thing 
that he's got to be a little aware of once they get going here. Working through turn three for what we uh, know will be the final time on a restart here. Evan Pasoko, they're about to go back racing. It'll be a two lap to go restart for the final two laps from Pocono, but do we get all of those five miles in under greed? Final time, the pace car going to drop down and in, and the field is going to be in the hands of Colson Bermudez. Green flag flies, not a good jump on the outside. Andrew Bird is falling behind, and a lot of contact behind as he brings a two-car length lead to turn one. Andrew Bird did not get going at all, and they're fanning out as they head to turn one. Everybody's fighting for track position now. He goes way wide. That's going to open the door for, I believe, the 83 of Adam Benefil, along with the 88 of Andrew Freenars. They are still going as they come off turn two. But now Adam Benefil is battling for that third position now as they head to the tunnel. He's the next driver now on four fresh tires trying to find his way back to the point. As they work through the tunnel, you see he gets a good run up off. He's going to be able to take that third position. And now he's got to set his sights on David Washington. But now here comes Freenars back to the bottom of the racetrack. And the 83 was hustled a bit. Freenars took that lane away, and the 83 got boxed out on the outside. He's got a lot of speed again this time at three, but he's got nowhere to bring it. Can he sneak through? He does. Slicing to the inside. One lap to go. Caution flag flies. Just a millisecond before Colson Bermudez would take the white flag. This race will not go to the end as the caution comes out with moments to spare. Yeah, and that, that's an unfortunate break for Adam Benefield because with those four fresh tires and still having a couple of laps remaining, he probably could have made something happen there and go after the race leaders. As you see, a big wreck on the, the back front stretch there, the replay on your screen now. That started, I believe, around Brandon Bowie coming up off the corner, uh, made some contact with a couple of other drivers, and unfortunately it just didn't end well uh, for any of those guys. It looks like it actually started in front of him I couldn't catch the number on that car that he made contact with, but a big, big wreck. I believe that was Sean Boundy now that I see that a little bit clear. Uh, he got into, and this unfortunately led to a chain reaction wreck that sent David Comstock and a couple others down pit road here uh, to end this race. Well, there's nobody going to be complaining that they waited too long to throw that caution, cough, cough. And in fact, in this scenario, unlike in an overtime line situation, the opposite works. Whereas uh, on the NASCAR side of things, if the yellow comes out after the line, um, then the race will not restart. If it were to have come out before, then they would have opposite here, as uh, the caution does come out after the line. But uh, it got out just before Bermuda has got to that point. Caution lights came on. It takes an opportunity away for the likes of Washington and Benefield. But Colson Bermudez is not going to mind the means of transportation. He will drive to a second straight RSR Full Throttle Cup Series win, winning tonight from Pocono. And what an incredible feat for Colson Bermudez right there. Uh, he, he's going to have to pace around for about two more laps here uh, before he gets the official checkered flag. But a big, big race for Colson Bermudez, uh, getting his second win in a row, uh, assuming he can get around for two more laps uh, cleanly without any issues here. Uh, came into this race last week at Indy, dominated the race, got away with a big victory, comes in here tonight, starts on the pole, dominates again, has a couple of issues, gets shuffled back through the field. Now he gets redemption here at Pocono and is going to get his second win. Right, as long as he doesn't drop out of this race, that is. We're not going to go back green, so Washington's not going to have an opportunity to fight with the likes of Benefield and company. And I feel like in, in the five or so years that we've been doing this, I've only seen it happen once. And I already mentioned something earlier in this race about if a caution were to come out, that would really mess things up. I think I said we got 10 laps in. So far, so good. No cautions and a caution came out. So I'm not even going to describe what I'm alluding to. But the 14 needs to be able to pace his way to the end of this thing. But solidified his position the last time by the start finish line. I was up front. And I thought Benefield was actually in front of Washington at the time the caution came out, but that time by iRacing told the Donnie to Washington to go back in front, so Benefield's gonna end up in third when this is all said and done. Freenar's fourth, Crowder in fifth position, 
but the 14 has to take about another two minutes and 20 seconds until it's going to be official. Pace car light still on top. There's no way, as we noted when we came to that restart, that there would be enough time to be able to get uh, this race back under green flag conditions. So lights off on the pace car. White flag going to come this time by. Uh, the Warriors got two and a half miles to get around and two, I guess, three very different stories, Brian, that we're taking a look at inside of the top three and we will talk with these finishers uh, come the end of this thing, but Bermudez starts on pole, finishes up front. A lot happened in between those two points, but he ends up at a plus minus zero on the night. Washington started 16th, comes home in second, and then Benefield way back from 30th to come home in third. Very different evenings for the guys up front. Well, and, and I think this is a statement for Adam Benefield because he came back last week and he, he got a good finish. We talked to him after the race, and he said, I'm back, and I'm going to come out here, and I'm going to try to to run for this championship. He won back at Las Vegas, the third race of the season, and he had not been in this series since then. He had not ran a single race since Las Vegas. He came back last week at Indy, finished up inside the top three, and he said he's going to run for the championship. He just has to get inside the top 30 in points, which he has a little bit of, of work to do that as he had dropped all the way back to 41st, or actually 47th, uh, before last week. He sits 41st coming into this race, so he's still got a handful of drivers to jump across. Uh, but once he moves into that top 30, assuming he does, that's a playoff position that's going to be disappearing for a couple of those drivers that are trying to point their way in and, and try to get into the uh, playoffs that way. Uh, so those guys have to be mindful of that as well. Uh, guys like Ross Cato, Nelson Rivera, Shane Ewing, those drivers that are right around that cutoff spot, they have to pay attention to that. And something else we talked about earlier, talking about all those positions, 10th through 16th and the points in the playoff grid into tonight, we're off of points. But if somebody without a win were to get a win, that would take a spot away from those. That's good news for everybody in on points. And it's also good news for the drivers below the cut line because they still are going to have seven positions in on points to fight for through the end of this thing. But Cole Sid Bermudez, how about back-to-back -back wins? Takes it at Pocono, not as thrilling fashion as it was from the end at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This one at a slowed pace. But the stat sheet could reflect it just the same, and I think he's feeling a lot better than he was 30 laps ago when it looked like it was crumbling apart. And you got to believe he is going to be celebrating this victory in a big way. As you mentioned, about 30 laps ago, it looked like he was going to be falling to a, maybe a, outside of the top five, maybe even outside of the top ten finish after he made contact with the outside wall. He hurt that car's aerodynamics and just didn't quite have the speed that he was looking for. But a two-tire call on pit road, albeit with a, a mistake as he slid through his box, uh, it worked out in his favor because he was able to get the lead, a couple of quick cautions, and he comes away with the win. And as he heads back around to the front straightaway, he has some celebrating to do, in which after that we will catch up with him and the rest of your top finishers. So we'll take this quick opportunity to step aside from the Pocono Raceway. And when we come back, we'll take a look at your full race results and talk to your top finishers. Colson Bermudez, second week in a row, is a winner at a Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series presented by Gary Mercer Trucking. And we will talk with him on the post-race show next. You're watching LSR TV on RaceBot TV. Hi guys, I'm Scott Speed, driver of this amazing Volkswagen Beetle GRC car. I got good news for the iRacing fam. We got this coming in. I'm currently working on it myself personally to make sure that it is as accurate as possible. With the addition of dirt and now this mean car, it is gonna be so fun. And it's gonna be available free to all the iRacing members. Person, I can't wait to get out there and race you guys on it.
Welcome back live to the Pocono Raceway, where we'll go tracks down and talk with some of your top finishers in just a bit. As LSR TV's continuing coverage of the RSR Full Throttle Cup Series continue into tonight with 20 races now complete. And Colson Bermudez is a back-to-back -back winner. Following tonight, we close in on the last handful of races before the playoffs and to the end of this 2017 campaign. But as always, we're happy that you're with us tonight for a little bit of a special presentation of LSR TV on Race Spot TV. Hugh Louis standing in for in standing in tonight for Cisco as our producer. Top side with you, Evan Pasoko and Brian DeMacklin. We'll go track side in a moment as we get the drivers with us. First, let's look at where everybody shook things out after 200 miles in tonight's Pocono Mountains 200. Bermudez, P1 to P1, started up front and finished up front. It was an eventful evening, but he ends up getting the moment it's all said and done, goes back to back. David Washington, 16th to second, and Adam Benefield, 30th to third. We'll be chatting with them in a moment. Andrew Fernandez and Ashton Crowder come home inside at the top five with Andrew Bird, Daniel Everhart, John Abbott, six, seven, and eight. Justin Lizardby is ninth, and Christopher Herlow is 10th. Shane Ewing will finish in the 11th position here tonight, followed by Ross Cater. Those two drivers are trying to fight for a spot in the playoffs. Then we have Nick Silver finishing 13th. David Comstock finishes 14th and is the last driver to finish on the lead lap here tonight. Lionel Calisto will finish 15th one lap down. Then Sean Bounty will finish 16th, followed by Joseph LaPlaca in 17th. Nathan Little goes to 18th and Brandon Bowie. Ran up front most of the race, had a very fast car, but got caught up in the last trek of the evening. He'll finish 19th, and then Trevor Apollo will finish 20th. Continuing on through 21st position is Dylan Jones. 22nd, Elsa Rivera, Corey Wolf in 23rd, uh, Dwayne Vincent in 24th, and Austin Coop 25th. And again, these drivers, you start to get the double digits laps down. Things didn't necessarily work out for them come the end of this one. 26th for Shawna Castle, Capewood, 27th. Corbett M Street is 28th. Braided Whitaker is 29th. And Giovanni Bramante is 30th. 31st will go to Jonathan Cadell, followed by Tanner Tallarico, finishing 32nd. Then Carl Shedd will come home 33rd. 34th goes to Randy Yoakum. 35th is Douglas Wyatt. And then Michael Priester had an issue at the beginning of the race with his connection. Never could really rebound from that. He finishes 36th and fills out this 36-car field here tonight at Pocono. And Evan Pasoko. Welcome back to RSR on Monday nights. Now you're down in victory lane with the guy that's won two races in a row, Colson Bermudez. Ready to point the show for the number 14 Aegis team over the last couple of weeks, and he is finishing up that donut. We'll be trackside with him, hoping to chat with your race winner in just a moment while we wait to see if we can get those drivers on the microphone, Brian. Tonight had a lot, and I, I'm going to be honest, I am not the biggest fan of Pocono. It is a very difficult track, though, it's very fun to drive. I just don't like driving it in a stock car because it takes a lot of skill, and that's something that I lack. That's why I talk somewhat successfully more times than driving. However, it was a fun race. We had a little bit of everything. We had, um, you know, drivers... Uh, pitch strategy, caution flags coming out. We even got our way through, despite the amount of yellows we saw in the first half of the race to a cycle, the green flag pit stops as well. So I think there was a little bit of everything, and you can never complain when you get a late race restart. Would I like to see it go to the end? However, Bermudez will take it either way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just one of those deals where for Colson Bermudez, he, he wants to go get the victory no matter what, whether it be because of cautions or be because he's able to just drive away from it uh, and go after it that way. If you're Adam Benefield or Andrew Freenars, Ashton Crowder, one of these drivers that was on four fresh tires, you, of course, want to try to have the opportunity to go green to the finish and see if you can't take it away that way. And you got to feel bad for a couple of those drivers that uh, had an opportunity to go get one. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about Andrew Freenars because had the caution come out, or had the caution not come out, uh, that ended the green flag run, he may have been able to have made it to the end on fuel and potentially go the distance and steal a win away from the drivers that ran up front all night long. And unfortunately, he, he didn't quite get that. He still got a good finish, finishing inside the top five and in fourth, uh, but just didn't quite have what he was looking for uh, to go the distance. 
When we talk about the significance of tonight's race at a championship, we are trackside now with the driver of the number 14. Colson, congratulations. Back-to-back -back wins, Indianapolis and now Pocono. Not two tracks that would have been necessarily compared to one another. They base turn two at this joint off for of the Brickyard, but you guys are hot right now. You had a fast car from the get-go, started on pole position. You win this race, but... At lap 50, it wasn't looking so good. You had a very eventful evening. Oh, yeah. I started off good. I felt like I had a chance to win it, and then I choked that restart a little bit and let Boo get to the lead. And from there, around lap 40, 50, I ended up getting in the wall. So that gave me about 25 seconds of damage. And from then, I just longed for the ride, falling back nice and slow. And then when that cause came out, I knew from the get-go I was going to take two because that was probably my only shot. You had a couple of, uh, really a handful of restarts. I think the first three in this race going side by side with you and Brandon. And then on one of those restarts, he got you on the outside. A caution flag came out, and then you guys ended up switching up. And that's when you started to fall back. I know that you weren't a fan of the restart that the 44 had, and I believe it was looked at, and no further action was taken. At that point, you fell down to fifth. That wasn't technically the lowest you would have been running in all night. Uh, if you look at the stat sheet, it'll stay lower just based on cycling through everything. But did you feel at that moment uh, that things were kind of falling apart? Were you frustrated at all? And if so, were, how'd you kind of settle yourself back down and lock in? Well, on that restart, I had a good jump. I went had the time the pace car, but I ended up going before the pace car, so I just lifted so I wouldn't get uh, penalized for it. But for it, but what made me mad about that restart is I lifted for him when I went for it, but yet, you know, he went before it. And... I, yeah, it was frustrating, but there was nothing I could do. I, all the damage, any little bit of damage here is killer. It, arrow is so important. Obviously, coming into tonight, the, the only question I guess remaining, and I feel like we've all been in relative agreement that it will be happening, is that you guys need to technically get into the top 30 at points for that first win to count, and you could probably get a 25th place finish for each of the next five weeks and still get enough points to be able to make that small climb up. Tonight will definitely help, so you only need one win to get in. Why not take a handful? You get your second here back-to-back. -back. I know it's got to feel good. Oh, it's got to feel good, but hopefully after tonight, I will have walked myself in the top 30. I think before tonight, I was 21 points out of the top 30, and this will for sure help. So going forward, we could only look uh, furthermore on this schedule and have to question if you guys are able to keep this going. Really changing things up, though, as we head into uh, what has ended up being the fifth last race on the regular season, Watkins Glen. I said that Indy and Pocono weren't really alike. That really applies to the race coming up in seven days' time. What's it going to be like for you and the 14 team there? Ooh, I don't know. I'm not the best road racer, but I feel like I have some... Decent, decent speed. I should be able to probably scavenge out a top five from it. You guys are hot. The team's hot. You get back-to-back -back wins in the RSR Full Throttle Cup Series. Cole, so we'll let you get out of here. But first, the sponsors, the shout-outs, and all those good folks. It makes it happen. I'd like to thank everybody at Aegis. Uh, it's great to be with them this week. they awesome to hang out with them. Thank you to all of them for letting me join the team. And, yeah. Seems like it was the right call. You guys are feeling good. And if there's any time to go on a streak... Playoff time is the time to do so, and as we wind down there, you guys are constantly improving. So I uh, want to congratulate you on the way to what's work, Colson. Best of luck going forward. We will hopefully, for your cakes, uh, maybe we'll talk to you again next week if you guys can keep it up. Good luck there. Thank you very much. So that's the driver who gets the win. Flip side of the coin, the driver who was questioning just what if, Brian, what if we didn't get that caution? What if we were able to get those two final laps to the end? It's still a good result. For the driver who comes home, but he would have liked a little bit more, Benefield is third, and you're with him. Yeah, Adam Benefield down here on pit road. You were looking for that race to stay green flag so you could take advantage of the four fresh tires and maybe go up there and challenge Colson and Dave and possibly go out there and get the win. Welcome back yet again here. I got to talk to you last week, uh, but what an incredible race for you here tonight. Take us through your evening. It was, you know, it was uh, started off slow. We got in here and didn't have really good uh, pace, I guess you could say. And so I decided to start in the back and uh, started picking our way up through there. 
and made our, made our way into the side of the top 10 and we had a caution and me and uh, Dylan Jones got the moving through the field pretty good and uh, he went through the tunnel turn and barely clipped the left front on the uh, rumble strip so he got loose and uh, I knew he was going to back out of it so I kind of tried to cut him a little slack and backed out of it too but I didn't realize it was going to be that much and so with like I think it was 20 to go I'm spinning out in front of the field down in the grass so uh, we get it back going and uh, just started you know we were in desperation mode there we were just going to go as long as we possibly could and uh, just as hard as we possibly could and just pray for a caution and everybody pitted and got ourselves uh up to third and the caution came out luckily with a i don't know like 10 to go or something and uh i felt like we had a chance i found something in turn three that was giving me really great drive off the corner so uh you know right before that last caution came out i was up under david and i think it was gonna leave me about three laps to get to colson and uh i mean i felt like we had we let one get away from us tonight we i felt like we had a good car and uh we especially had you know the better speed on that last run just because of the four tires but you know we come come away with another top three another podium and uh you know cars in one piece we're moving up in points to get into the chase well and that that was something i was actually going to touch on this was a really good finish towards getting you back into the top 30 in points so that your win back at las vegas can count towards a spot in the playoffs and it's safe to say that if you can have runs like tonight for, through the next uh, handful of races that you're not going to have any issues uh, getting there. Uh, but next week, you're not going to be going left all the time. You're going to be making a couple of right-hand turns. What are your thoughts about Watkins Glen? <laughs> yeah, I'm not a road racer. <laughs> so we're just going to shoot for a top 10 there. Um, you know, we'll see how it goes or whatnot. But, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. We'll definitely – try to turn some laps i got a pretty good uh teammate at one up that's a hell of a road racer so we'll get with him and maybe he can give me some pointers well and, and noting that you also have a couple of tracks that are going to be really fun after that we have michigan bristol darlington and richmond if you had to pick between the next five races uh, as an opportunity for you to go back and get your second victory of the season which of those five would be that track uh any of them besides Watkins Glen. <laughs> I hear that as a fellow driver that's not all that great on road courses. I fully understand that, so I'm not going to give any flack there. Before we let you go, Adam, just want to give you a chance once again to say thank you to your sponsors and say hello to any friends or family. Who makes it happen for you on the 83 machine? Just the guys that want to, uh, for letting me come out and hang out with you guys on Monday night. Uh, my beautiful wife and two kids for letting me come in here and, uh, you know, get to, get to do what I like, like to do and, uh, you know, that's race, so, you know, and John Abbott for giving me the opportunity to get back in here, and, you know, just everybody, everybody that's helped me out along the way, I really appreciate it. Oh, he came back last week after having not ran since Las Vegas, finished second at Indianapolis last week. This week here at Pocono, finishes third. Congratulations, Adam. We look forward to you back here in the series next week at Watkins Glen. Hopefully, we'll get to talk to you again. Appreciate it, man. All right, that was Adam Benefield, finishes third here at Pocono. Now I'm going to slide over to Dave Washington, who was having a little bit of issues dealing with some heat exhaustion. Dave, uh, we finally get to uh, catch up with you here on pit road. You had a really solid night here tonight, finishing second uh, after having a really short race last week at uh, Indy. Uh, take us through your evening. Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, didn't didn't uh, really focus on qualifying too much. Um, I thought really tonight we were going to get the long runs that we needed, but they just didn't fall our way. So it was pretty much, you know, you pit, come back out in the same spot and, you know, try it again and you get another yellow and just, you know, just keep doing the same thing all over. And then I finally got tired of it and everybody else, you know, stayed out. I went in and it put me back like 17th. And I was watching Adam throughout the first part of the race and he started back there and coming up through. And I said, you know what, I might as well try it. And uh, so we went back there and tried to follow him up to back to the front. And how hard was it working your way through traffic here tonight? You, we didn't really talk about you much throughout the night. As a matter of fact, towards the end of the race, I noted that we really hadn't said your name other than at the beginning of the race and then at the midway race break. Uh, it was a very uh, uneventful night for you until the end. How hard was it trying to navigate your way through all that traffic tonight? 
Yeah, the, the bottom was tough. Um, unless you had newer tires or, you know, somebody was on a different strategy, the, the bottom was really tough. So we had to really try to get to the outside the best we could. Um, it, it was just super hard to pass. I was just trying to just one car at a time. Um, however long it took me to get past them, I just took my time. I didn't want to, you know, get up in anybody trying to do no crazy moves or anything. So we just, uh, you know, just keep plucking them away. And we got towards the front there and uh, it started looking good. Then that late race caution there, you know, the strategy of, uh, you know, Colson. Everybody was on their own strategy tonight. Uh, most of the guys took four and um, I was talking with Andy and he's like, let's do two. Get track position and see. You know, because we figured a lot more people would have done the same thing. Well, and we talked about it back in the middle of May when you were going through a, a pretty big drought where you were having a couple of really bad races, finishing outside of the top 20, not even finishing a couple of those races. Uh, you've been on a pretty good stretch with the exception of the blemish last week at Indy. You've been in the top 10 every week since Daytona uh, back in the beginning of June. Uh, it seems like you guys have gotten your stride back to where it needs to be as we get closer to the playoffs. I think a lot of the strides come from not having any pressure, really. We're just kind of just biding our time and waiting for the chase to start and, you know, um, not really trying to get too crazy around anybody. Um, there was, you know, tonight there was a lot of give and take um, that I seen, uh, the guys that I tried to pass and stuff, um, and, and that's a good thing always. I, I really don't know what happened tonight, but I have to go back and watch the replay and see. And with four wins, certainly you don't have any pressure about trying to make the playoffs. It's pretty much just cruising and, and, and sailing your way into the playoffs. And right now you have the most victories out of anybody, so you're going to have the most bonus points when the playoffs start. Before we let you go, Dave, just want to give you a chance to say thank you to your sponsors and say hi to any friends or family. Who makes it happen for you on the 98 machine? Yeah, definitely got to give a big shout-out to uh, Julio uh, each and every week for uh, letting us do this. Um, the whole team, Jones, Daniel, uh, Colson, a new member there. Good to have him on the team. Um, Andrew, Giovanni, there's a whole bunch of us that uh, practice together and stuff. Uh, my mom watching every week. Uh, you guys for broadcasting it and John and them for, you know, allowing us to be here. All right. Well, congrats on your second place finish here tonight, Dave, and good luck next week at the road course. Thanks, guys. That's Dave Washington. He finished second here tonight. He's looking ahead to the playoffs with his four victories. He's guaranteed a spot in the playoffs and right now would hold the number one seed when they elect the bonus points out to those drivers. Evan Pasoko, what an incredible race we had here tonight that led to Colson Bermudez getting his second win. Absolutely incredible racing out of these guys. And it should be really fun next week at the road course Watkins Glen. And you're absolutely not going to want to miss that one. But as you noted when you were talking with our third-place finisher there, Adam Penafield, there's a lot of fun tracks coming up. Watkins Glen, I would highlight that one because that one is going to be absolutely thrilling as we send these guys out onto a road course to mix things up for just a little bit. Uh, we also saw Sonoma earlier on in the season, and in fact, that was only a couple of weeks ago. So they're coming very close in the season together. But Michigan, Bristol, Darlington, and Richmond, there is... In the, you can, two ways you can look at it. If you're on the outside of the cut line, Brian Macklin, there is not a lot of time left. If you're on the inside, there is way too many races still to go with five left. Yeah, absolutely. And and next week is a, a big, big race for several drivers. We heard Adam Benefield talk about he does not look forward to going to Watkins Glen next week because he's not a road course driver. You heard Colson Bermudez as well saying he'd be happy just to come out with a top five. So uh, next week is going to be interesting to see. And it's an opportunity for some of these drivers that, that may not necessarily be as fast as others on the ovals, but might be able to show some speed on the road courses and get up there and maybe get a victory that they wouldn't otherwise be able to gr grab and then go ahead and get themselves a spot in the playoffs and definitely be able to uh, work their way in there and then be a factor for the championship. This is going to be a very interesting stretch of five races because we have the road course, then we have two short tracks with Bristol and Richmond, and then we have the, the two-mile Michigan and then Darlington. It couldn't get much more exciting than that. you got so many different styles of racetracks coming up and so many opportunities for guys to go out there and get a win. 
And this is not the only excitement that you can find right here on LSR TV at iRacing Live this week. We hope that you stick with us coming up this Wednesday, the series debut of the Championship Esports Association's Myrtle Beach Speedway Simulation Series. Friday night's always busy with the Super Speedway Cup Series. And of course, RSR picks things back up again next Monday evening. If you want a full look at our upcoming broadcast schedule, you can find us online at www.livesimracing.com. The surefire way to make sure you're up to date with us, though, is by following us on social media. That's Twitter at LSRTV and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash LSRTV official. So until next time, on behalf of the entire team at LSRTV, the folks behind the scenes, Cisco Scarboos, the DJ Lion, the crew tonight for myself, Evan Pasoko, and Brian Backlid. And a big thanks to our friends at Race Spot TV and Hugo Louise for pushing the buttons. I want to congratulate Colson Bermudez as a back-to-back -back winner at the RSR Full Throttle Cup Series. It'll be a challenge if he can go for three. We'll be back with you next Monday night, same time, same place, but from Watkins Glen International for the 21st race on the 2017 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series campaign. That race and every race can be found right here on LSR TV, the voice of sim racing. Until next time, good night.